Hello? Um, did you sign in with the sergeant at arms? All right, would you please do that so we can get you done first, otherwise you're gonna be here for the rest of the day. So if you would do that, I'm gonna hold the hearing. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Parks and Recreation Committee hearing, um, which is going to be on uh, protecting our city's beaches from erosion. But we do have another matter which we will be voting on um, as we go forth this day. And we have one person who's here to testify on that. That is the renaming of nearly 100 streets and uh, thoroughfares in the city of New York for distinguished uh, New Yorkers who are no longer with us. Uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, if you would come forward and take a seat and give us your thoughts on that. You see the light? Okay, you're set. Now I see the light. Um, <laughs> Glad somebody does. <laughs> These are dark days. Um, good morning. I'm here to briefly um, speak in favor of the renaming of Gold Street for Ida B. Wells uh, Barnett, who was, uh, I think, one of the greatest journalists in the history of our country. She, of course, um, became a Brooklyn resident briefly after she was run out of Memphis for writing editorial about the true cause of the lynchings of black men. One of her um, favorite quotes of, I guess I should introduce myself, huh? Sorry, uh, I'm very passionate about Ida B. Wells. Um, my name is Nicole Hannah-Jones. I'm an investigative reporter at the New York Times Magazine, and I'm also uh, the co-founder of an organization called the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigative Reporting. And what we do is train and mentor journalists of color to work in the tradition of Ida B. Wells to become investigative journalists as well. What Ida B. Wells said was uh, to write wrongs, you must shine the light of truth upon them. And I think in this day, um, it's very important to recognize those fearless journalists in a free press who worked very hard to shine the light of truth on uh, this country and public officials who were withholding civil rights from Americans. And I think uh, this is kind of a perfect time to think about renaming a street after uh, Ms. Wells. She came to live here, as I said briefly, after she was run out of town for her lynching editorials. Um, she gave a speech here in New York, and that allowed her the proceeds to print that editorial into a pamphlet, which was dispersed all across the world, and really shined a light on uh, the lynching of black men in this country. And she actually dedicated that uh, first pamphlet to the black women of Brooklyn and New York. So I would just like to uh, argue in favor of the renaming. I think it would be uh, great for this the citizens of our great borough. With your, testimony, with your testimony, I think it's unanimous because you're the only person <laughs> testifying on this. Uh, I'll talk a little more about it later, but there are uh, other great New Yorkers that, um, and some people who weren't necessarily New Yorkers who are going to be naming streets. Um, we'll pass it in committee today, I'm sure. And uh, as a former editor of my school paper at Binghamton, <laughs> um, I am obviously happy to be a supporting journalist. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. We've been joined uh, thus far by uh, my colleague Andy Cohn from uh, the Bronx and uh, from the far southern reaches of the Borough of Queens, uh, Mr. Donovan Richards. Um, uh, good morning, everybody, again. And I'm going to read an opening statement, and um, then we'll call our first witnesses uh, on uh, the, the public hearing today. Uh, this hearing will examine the practices used by multiple levels of government to combat beach erosion and the success rate of those efforts, and more specifically, 
Uh, but more specifically, we will look into the closure by the Department of Parks and Recreation of a uh, relatively large swath of the Rockway beaches due to erosion. The city has 14 miles of beaches which are managed by the Department of Parks and Recreation. And we know erosion is a natural and usually cyclical process in which a beach erodes and builds back up again in response to wave action and usually worsens uh, during severe storm. Most of the time that's in the winter in New York City. Climate change plays a role as well. According to the New York City Panel on Climate Change, the sea level around New York City has risen uh, 1.1 feet in the last 115 years, and more worrisome is projected to rise an additional 2.5 feet by the year 2050. While it is unknown what exact effect on erosion uh, this may have, it is likely to be significant as time goes by. Erosion is typically managed with hard and soft techniques. Hard engineering includes using permanent man-made structures such as jetties, seawalls, groins, and revetments to stabilize shorelines and protect property behind those structures. Soft engineering includes using natural elements such as sand, sands, dunes, and vegetation to soften the land water interface, helping prevent erosive forces from reaching the back shore. Soft engineering for coastal management includes beach uh, nourishment, renourishment, sand dune stabilization, and beach drainage. Policymakers, uh, many in this room, have to be careful in deciding what types of erosion techniques to promote. Ill-conceived structures built to prevent erosion in one location may actually increase in adjacent, adjacent locations by blocking sand movement, deflecting or increasing wave energies, and removing vegetation, resulting in the disruption of the natural balance of shoreline change. The New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the DEC, identifies coastal areas vulnerable to erosion and designates them as coastal erosion hazard areas. DEC has identified three of those in the city, the Rockaway Peninsula in Queens, Coney Island in Brooklyn, and the south shore of Staten Island. The Rockaways have historically suffered a great deal as a result of erosion, and just as they have recovered from uh, much of their beaches after Super Sand Standy, uh, Super Storm Sandy. Last year was particularly difficult as numerous nor'easters struck the city, uh, including this winter and even into this spring, and dealt a very harsh blow to the beaches. As a result of this severe erosion on May 21st, uh, just a few days before the beaches were to open, the Parks Department announced that an 11 block stretch of Rockaway Beach between Beach 91st and Beach 102 streets would be closed indefinitely because of the erosion of the sand there. This, comes, uh, this news comes years after the Army Corps replenished sand in the area in 2014 following Sandy, but the renourishment was obviously not enough in and of itself to secure the viability of the area for a longer period of time. While the severity of the erosion faced by the Rockaways has come as a surprise to no one, least of all uh, the over 100,000 people who live there, the lack of a sufficient and speedy response by all levels of government to fix the situations, uh, situation continues to astound many in the city. A recent New York Times article put it very clearly, quote, how the Rockaways got to this point is a story of an inaction and finger pointing between New York City officials and the Army Corps of Engineers, so whose uh, mission includes reducing the risk in coastal areas and which has played a large role in restoring the region's coastline after Hurricane Sandy. It is clear that the city and its federal partners need to act fast to fix this. That's one of the focuses today of this hearing. It seems clear that a multi-pronged approach is absolutely necessary, including the renourishment of sand along with other approaches to limit more erosion and to keep the sand that's already there like building jetties, groins, and other structures to keep more s sand from being lost. The activists and residents of the Rockaways, whom I've had the pleasure of working with for many, many years, have done everything in their power to protect their beaches and continue to do so by protesting, writing to their elected officials, uh, all of whom will be here today, and raising the issue at a recent mayoral town hall. Uh, but all of this activism has not resulted in the one thing that they need the most, a beach that is fully open and accessible to the residents of the Rockaways and all the people who want to use it. Um, the beach has been immortalized in song by the Ramones. Um, it was a long time ago, but the words still ring true. We need to revisit whether the old techniques of combating erosion are still working 
and look at alternatives that may be better at fighting erosion in our changing world, but we need to do so quickly and efficiently so that the gems of our city's summer recreational spaces, uh, our beaches, are viable now and for future generations. I hope that this hearing helps to get us there. Thank you. We will um, be taking a brief part of this hearing, as I said before, to vote on two pieces of legislation. Uh, the first will be our semi-annual street ceremonial co-naming bill. The bill will ceremonial name, ceremonially name 94 thoroughfares and public places throughout the city. Uh, I am proud of my own district to be co-naming Ahmad Diaway um, in Community Board 8, Armenia Way in uh, Community Board 11, and just down the block from that, we will also rename Bell Boulevard where it reaches the Long Island Expressway, Bayside Hills, 911 Memorial Way. And I urge my colleagues on this committee to vote in favor of this legislation. Um, the second is a resolution uh, co-sponsored by uh, council members Jumani Williams and our majority leader, Lori Cumbo. This resolution would recognize the tremendous contributions that in New Yorkers of Haitian ancestry have made to our city and state. It would ceremonially designate an area of Flatbush in Brooklyn as Little Haiti, and I urge my colleagues again to support this resolution as well. All right, I've spoken enough. Um, we have with us the Burr President here yet. On the way up. All right, I am going to take uh, the chair's indulgence and uh, I'm going to wait for my Burr President, who is an outstanding supporter of parks, as uh, Commissioner Lewandowski uh, of Queens knows and Commissioner Silver knows. So, um, the Borough President before her, Helen Marshall, the Borough President before her, uh, also outstanding supporters of our parks. Uh, to join the Borough President at this time as well, uh, we are joined by uh, Senator Dabo. If you would, you could take one of those seats, I would be happy. All right, I'm told that uh, the Borough President and Congressman Gregory Meeks are in the elevator, so that's assuming the elevators are working. <laughs> Want to recognize Senator Dabo, former chair of the Parks Committee of the New York City Council. Great he told me it was the best job he ever had. That's on the record now, Joe, Thank so. <laughs> Other than being a state senator, of course. Good morning, Borough President. Could you? Yes. Would you? 
I'd like you to uh, join Senator Adabo at the, at the seat there, along with Congressman Meeks. Good morning, everybody. Morning, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to actually read my essay to you. All right. Um, Borough President, ladies first. As I said, Congressman first. That's what I meant to say. It's clearly uh, whoever would like to go first. Uh, I have to move my testimony first. <laughs> That's why I have this pen right here. So. Yeah, good morning and welcome to the. Yeah, I apologize for the confusion, but I will say that one thing about. Uh, this office building. Your security is impeccable downstairs. <laughs> I wish I could take credit for that. The borough uh, president, the congressman, we <laughs> making calls. So uh, we um, we thank you for that. Um, this has been a very uh, frustrating experience uh, in the Rockaways. As you know, we had uh, Superstorm Sandy uh, many years ago, many years ago. Um, and it has been one thing after the other to try and get the beaches back to where they should be. Um, as you know, recently, though, uh, after a history of the Army Corps of Engineers, after a history of getting the boardwalk um, completed and actually safer for the residents of the, of, the, of the area of Rockaways, which, by the way, is the first defense when it comes to Queens, right, is the right. Rockaway beaches, they have to be safe. The same way they got to be safe in Coney Island, same way they have to be safe all over the city of New York. Um, and to get to the point where there was at least some comfort level uh, is extremely important. We're now awaiting the Army Corps of Engineers to really do the final jetties and all that has to come with uh, protecting our beaches. Uh, to make it to this day, um, we have been very clear with the uh, Parks Department that there is fear that the beaches would have to be closed. That unless, because the sand had been um, coming out every single day. And it's just amazing uh, how quickly it is eroding. Um, and so we've had many discussions in addition to the Build a Back program, in addition to all of the uh, meetings that we've had with the Parks Department and with the community. It really is the community that said, we are watching the beaches erode. We are sitting here every day seeing that the sand needs to be replenished. And uh, unfortunately, um, Recently, that hasn't happened. I think that everyone is waiting for the Army Corps of Engineers to finish what they need to do for the yep, permanent protection. They are protection. here this morning to testify. Um, but I would argue that there is a way for us to work with the Army Corps of Engineers, and out of an 80-something billion dollar budget in the city of New York, and whatever number the budget is on the federal government, a there lot. should be a way for us to put a small percentage of money back and fill these beaches with sand. It is number. Thank you, John Corey. No <laughs> it is, it, it is just, it's one of those things where you look at it and you say, I don't get it. It should be able to be done. Um, I will tell you that Congressman uh, Meeks and all of the elected officials and my good friend, Senator Adabo, have been really great partners in this. And we understand that there is a permanent solution that is coming. Um, unfortunately, we met in Congressman Meeks' office, and he can talk more about this, but he convened a, meet, a meeting a few weeks ago with the Army Corps and with the Parks Department talking about the ridiculousness of closing down 12 beaches, because that's really why we are here today, right? So you close down 12 beaches. You have a ferry at 108th Street. You close down 102nd Street to 91st Street. Um, and so you have people coming off the ferry you need to give them a reason to get past 102nd Street and get to the rest of the peninsula. Um, we have dedicated so much time and effort over the last four years to build the Rockaways up to the tourist attraction that it is. In fact, the ferry, by the way, is too small, right? Yes, it is. So now the city the next needs to rebid for the for bigger ferries and put more uh, routes on the ferry, and yet we're closing 12 beaches. Now, I understand that um, the, the commissioner called a lot of us uh, a few days ago, Commissioner Silver, who I have to say is always responsive and always there to talk to you and always does try. I will say that, that they are uh, very on top of trying. 
Um, and they are going to announce, I believe, that I don't know if I'm telling secrets here. I think, <laughs> sorry, Mr. Con Commissioner. Um, but they have now um, acquiesced, and I think it's important to note in a good way that by the concessions, uh, there will be two or three blocks open uh, around the concessions. So at least the concessions can survive and thrive uh, during the summer months. Um, the ferry is doing well, the boardwalk, all of it is working. But I do think that over the next few weeks, we should be able to figure out how to replenish those beaches, make sure that the folks in Rockaways get exactly what they deserve, which is also safety. These beaches are not just about tourism. These beaches are all about the fact that it also protects the residents of the Rockaways. And if the sand is deteriorating so fast on those beaches, what's to stop it next from coming up against that boardwalk and just going right over it in the next storm that comes, which is supposed to be the one storm out of 100 years, which we've had like five or six in the last few years. So I think it's an important aspect that you had this hearing. I appreciate it very much. Um, I know that uh, my colleagues will have a lot to say as well. I do want to note the cooperation um, from the Parks Department and from Commissioner Silver, uh, who is always responsive. And, and I do want to just acquiesce in one thing. I get the fact that the Army Corps is supposed to be doing the permanent fixing. I get the fact that it's not the norm for us to come in and put sand on the beaches. I will just say that after the Rockaways have been through what they've been through, after they are the ones that said you need a ferry because people will use it, and now we need a bigger and more route ferry. After the Rockaways told us what danger they are in every single day, after they're the ones that said that the sand was going to erode to the point where you're going to have to close beaches, I will argue that wherever the money comes from, it's time that we replenish the sand for the safety and for the tourism of the Rockaways. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Borough President. Thank you for your advocacy. Um, I know that you have been a a staunch supporter of parks in general, um, but certainly a very strong supporter of the Rockaway Peninsula, which, as you said, is our first line of defense. I was there uh, the day after Irene uh, with former Borough President Marshall, and I thought that was a big deal because the fascia boarding on the boardwalk was missing in many places until I was there the day after with former Borough President and Mayor Sol uh, Rest, uh, Marshall uh, after Sandy, and that was every nightmare hurricane that I'd ever seen on video had come to my home borough. So um, it is most importantly a matter of public safety. I think we'd all agree on that. But uh, we do call it Rockaway Beach. It's not the mountains. It's the beach. So um, that's important. So thank you for your testimony this morning. Uh, Congressman, how are you today? I'm Very sure good, you Mr. Chairman. you to say a few words? Thank you. Please. Now, this is the first time I think I've testified before the City Council in person. <laughs> I've sent notices, et cetera, uh, but uh, this uh, thought it was important for me to be here. We're very today. happy that you're here with us today. Because as the borough president uh, has indicated, and along working with uh, Senator Dabo, this is an issue uh, that regards safety and resiliency, and it re also requires a partnership uh, ultimately the partnership between the City of New York and, of course, the federal government with the Army Corps of Engineers and the State of New York. And there's got to be that kind of cooperation and communication that's uh, important. I concur with the Borough President in saying that uh, Commissioner Silva has been very responsive and the uh, Parks Department, uh, you know, any time that I've called, they've always returned the call and or uh, appeared in the office as the meeting that we just had. But I also have to say that what caught me by surprise was a few days before the opening of the beach season was the first time that we were informed that because of sand erosion, and though the community had been watching, et cetera, but because of the sand erosion, that this 12 blocks of beach would be closed for the summer. No communication, no warning from anyone at that time and to anyone. And so therefore, part of what I think that given the circumstance that we have in the Rockaways is I want to make sure that we have better communication because I believe that in that time, if we had more notice, working collectively together, given the amount of money that it would take to replenish the sand if we need to do that on a short-term basis, we could have at least tried to collectively found a solution and a resolution 
to the problem so that the beaches would not have to be closed. We could have worked together and we could have looked and tried to see what else could we do had we had any had more time. But it's the late announcement that struck struck me and with no solution other than we've got to shut the beach for the for, for the season. Now, yes, there's been four nor'easters, I guess this past year or two that has ravaged the beaches, but we know that and we know what the plan has to be long range. And I want to address that at the end of my remarks of what I think that we need to do because I think that the Army Corps has been working for the long range. But when I look at what's taking place right now and the negative effect and the financial impact that will lead and has led to a panic among local business owners who have built their businesses around the seasonal tourism as well as the concessions and the profits they make therein. This is what they do for the whole year. They built their livelihoods around this season. And I know that there has been various city agencies have pledged their support, but we need some urgency in the commitment so that we can have an effective alternative to what's taking place. Now, we actually had to talk to the Rockaway Business Alliance, and we asked them what was going on, and they mentioned three things that they need to happen, and I know that the city's working on some. One, Rockaway Beach is open for business campaign. We need that open, done citywide. Two, and this may not be in their jurisdiction, but we need to work because what also is hurting us during the summer season is we need, and because of this, the temporary lifting of the tolls coming into the Rockaways for the summer season because the Cross Bay Bridge toll is strangling our community and further isolates the Rockaways from the, fir from, from the rest of the city. And three, we could temporarily extend the scheduled ferry services until at least 11, between 11 and 12 p.m. because at, uh, it allows for late night dining. You know, folks are on the boardwalk, they're eating, uh, and they can get back on the boat and have a nice ride back. But we, so we need the ferry services uh, to schedule to be open at least until 11 p.m. Now, the urgency that I, again, that the Rockaway Business Alliance related to me, 75% of their members expect to lose a loss of customers as a result of this closing. 67% of their members expect a lower summertime revenue. 92% will be increasing marketing efforts as a result, costing them more money. And 85%, of course, want the elected officials uh, and the city agencies to advocate for Rockaway businesses in particular. We think that needs to be happened. So let me just conclude with this. You know, I know that we've got to find something immediate to try to save some of this beach season if it were possible. I also know as a result of our meeting that we had, I introduced an amendment because of the partnership, I introduced an amendment in the Water Resource Development Act that aims to expedite the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Superstorm Sandy study. Through, though the funding has already been appropriated for coastal protections, construction awaits the finalization of the report, and while we continue to search for short-term solutions to address this summer's closure, I know, and we are working together, we must also work toward the long-term solutions for protecting our coast from further erosion. So to fast-track our plans to safeguard our beaches, because what needs to be, this plan has to be approved. The bill that passed the House will fast track that so that it can be approved, the Army Corps can be approved, and we can begin to work on the long term a year earlier. Need the bill to pass the Senate. I've talked to Senator Schumer about that. So hopefully we'll get this done in time so that we don't have to worry about a closure, a long term closure for the next beach season and the beach season after that. But we've got to work in a, co in a, in a cooperative, way and communicate with one another, all three levels of government, which I think failed to happen here. Thank you very much, Congressman. I know you've been on top of this um, since the day after Sandy, and um, it, uh, 
I'm still blown away by what I saw that morning. So thank you for all your efforts, and I, I greatly <laughs> appreciate that, as do the residents of the Rockaways. At this time, we're going to take a quick break in this hearing. Um, I know we have Mr. Adabo, but we will get to him very, very quickly. Um, as I said, we will be voting on um, legislation um, to rename nearly 100 thoroughfares in the city of New York. Um, we have been joined at this time uh, by Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer of Queens, Councilman Costa Costantanides of Queens, uh, Con Councilman Andrew King of the Bronx, Councilman Eric Ulrich of Queens, and of course Justin Brannan, who uh, represents a large swath of southern Brooklyn. Um, the first piece of legislation that we're going to vote on today is a pre-considered intro um, to rename uh, 95 thoroughfares and public places. Uh, among the people that are being um, having streets and uh, thoroughfares renamed after them, um, some of them are people that most New Yorkers have never heard of, but some of them are uh, extremely famous, including uh, the boxer Muhammad Ali, um, Jack Rudin, who led the Association for a Better New York, Joseph Papp, who brought uh, Shakespeare to millions in Central Park, uh, Jimmy Breslin, the writer, um, John Brian Murtaugh, the former assemblyman, um, and Vito Marcantonio, uh, the great congressman uh, from the uh, East Harlem uh, way back in the day. Um, but other people whose names I recognize and would be recognizable uh, to some of those people in this room, Pat Patrick Beckles and Linda McDougall of East Elmhurst, uh, Maria Thompson from Woodhaven, um, uh, sadly, Detective Mia Sotas Familia, who was uh, murdered um, last year, um, and firefighter Thomas Patrick Phelan, among other heroes that we're renaming for today. So um, if I could call on the clerk, Billy Martin, to call the roll. But before that, I think uh, Andy King has uh, a brief statement to make. Councilman? Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> um, to all of us who are getting names, streets renamers throughout the city of New York, to the families, um, I offer my love. We offer our support as we continue to remember all those who are beacons in our community. But for me, it's a very special day because um, out of the two street renamings that are happening in my district, one is dedicated to my father, Andy Pops King Jr., who was instrumental for 25 years in our neighborhood, raising about 10,000 young men, saving their lives, using basketball as a tool to build their character, protect them from the elements of the neighborhoods, and just be, to be able to develop them into positive quality young men. So I just want to let Pops know that we are grateful in the borough of the Bronx for all he's done for the many of brothers who have become doctors, who have become judges, who have become elected officials, um, and who are just continuing to pass the to do the work that he's done to lay the foundation in the North Bronx and beyond. So that being said, I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to share a private moment with you um, what my dad meant to so many other young men growing up today. So thank you again, and thank you, everyone. I'm looking for everyone to vote now on all our street renamers in the new city of New York. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman King. Um, we'll also be uh, hearing, I'm going to give him a second to settle in, from Councilman Williams on the Little Haiti. Okay. It's going to be okay. Um, are you ready, uh, Councilman Williams? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is on? Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Congressman, Borough President. Hope everybody's okay. Um, I just want to speak a little bit on uh, a Little Haiti, which will be voted on uh, as a splotch of area in my district. I have to shout out uh, Assemblymember Rodney's Be Shot, who's uh, really the one who uh, helped spearhead this as a local council member. I was proud to, to put it in. There has been a, a lot of issues uh, locally around this issue, uh, particularly even with uh, the Anglo-Caribbean uh, community. Uh, but I thought it was uh, very important that this go forward, so I want to make sure I put on on the record. Uh, I am also uh, Anglo-Caribbean. My parents uh, come from the Grenada. Grenada. Uh, and I know that uh, even um, people have a tendency uh, to point at other, and so even within the Caribbean community, uh, there's often uh, Within that, people who are overlooked, and so in this in this day and age, when uh, Haiti uh, was called an S whole country uh, by uh, the president of the United States, and I'll say, even as I was growing up, 
there's a tendency uh, for folks uh, to try to look past the contributions, particularly of black history and in certain histories in particular. Africa and Haiti was one of those, and many of us used to joke about those cultures, uh, not knowing how much power was present uh, in those cultures. And I always say, as a black person and as American, uh, particularly indebted to Haiti, uh, one for being the first to free slaves, and two for doubling the size of this uh, country. Uh, but again, uh, even within the Caribbean community, um, we somehow looked down upon. Uh, Haitians and their contributions, and it wasn't just a language thing because uh, growing up in a Caribbean church and a Caribbean environment, Panamanians uh, were very much welcomed uh, into that field. For some reason, Haitians were not. I think it is beginning to change. I would say a lot of it sort of changed after the Fugees, uh, but um, uh, we still obviously have a, a long way to go. So when there is a group of people who feel uh, that they have a particular story, I always want to stand with those folks. And so uh, there were some people saying, why can't we have Little Caribbean? Why can't we have a little of this? It's, and I believe that we can have both. Uh, we can have Little Caribbean. I think we deserve, and the ca Haitian community deserves to have uh, Little Haiti. There's no reason when one of us rises, all of us doesn't rise. Uh, and to those who say, well, it would lead us to have uh, Little Grenada, Little Jamaica, um, there is something distinct uh, when you go to my community. Uh, you do go to Caribbean restaurants, Caribbean churches, and you'll see everyone mingling, enjoying, and having a good time. Uh, you go to a Haitian church, you go to a certain street, uh, the music will change. Uh, the rice will get a little blacker. Uh, uh, the, uh, the culture will shift just a little bit in those churches, and of course the language will change. I think that deserves some recognition. Uh, in addition to all the other cultures, not at the expense of it. So I'm very proud that uh, we're going to be voting on this uh, Little Haiti, and I'm looking forward to the council voting on it. And again, thank you, Council uh, Assemblyman Rodney Bishop, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, I do want to note uh, among the names, I, I, I read some of them before, Toussaint L'Overture Boulevard is also going to be named. That's today as well. So you want to. Yes, oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I, I didn't know that one was today. But Toussaint Louverture uh, is an extraordinary person, uh, one of the main people who primarily uh, led the fight uh, against uh, slavery. And we too often, I think, purposefully uh, are pushed to forget these heroes and forget the history um, so that, um, you know, maybe history will repeat itself for some people. And I see what's going on in 2018. So people like Toussaint Louverture uh, and uh, Jean Jacques Dessalines uh, should always be celebrated and should always be promoted. And the history can help bring pride and honor uh, to some people who, for some reason, uh, are pushed to believe that they uh, should not. So I'm very proud that that name is here as well. I look forward to uh, Jean Jacques Dessalines in the future. Thank you. Well, I learned about Mr. Overture at PS201 in Queens. So <laughs> we are getting something. Sorry, I want to thank, uh, sorry, Councilman Mallory Cumbo and Mark Traeger, who also helped push this. Thank you, Councilman. Um, among the other names, of course, are Ida B. Wells. Um, Ruby D and Ossie Davis, um, great, great uh, people of the stage and the screen, and um, uh, regrettably also Will Madonna, who had been a staffer um, for uh, then Assemblyman Mark Jonai, who passed away much, much too young. So uh, with that, I am told we are going to be voting on both of these at once. They'll be combined. So uh, Mr. Clerk. William Martin, Committee Clerk, Roll Call Vote Committee on Parks, Chair Gorlinchik. Aye and all. Cohen. Aye. Konstantinidis. Aye. King. I love the colors. I love the colors. And I vote aye and all. <laughs> ben Bramer. I vote aye. Brannon. Joe Nye. Aye and all. Ulrich. I vote aye on all. By a vote of eight in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, both items have been adopted by the committee. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, we'll now resume the hearing. We will hold that open. Uh, there are three more members. I know that uh, Councilman Moyer is holding his own hearing across the street, and um, the other two members as well. Uh, Mr. Varelli is in a hearing as well, and I don't know where the last person is. Um, we are now going to hear um, from Senator Joseph Adabo. Senator? That's okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank the committee members as well for their time here today, allowing me to give testimony and thank my constituents and the residents who have 
from Rockaway have shown up as well. So good morning, all. Uh, I don't mean to dwell on the past frustrations of why we are here, why we got here with the beaches closed. I think it's prudent upon ourselves to work together as going forward. And how do we salvage the summer of 2018? Uh, I am still hopeful that we can salvage some of this summer by reopening some, if not all, of the closed beaches. And I want to thank Commissioner Silver for listening to our, our residents and constituents and uh, doing what he can you know, for the safety of others and opening up some of those beaches. Um, I do think it's unacceptable that, you know, as residents and people from all over the city come to the Rockways and see closed beaches. You know, as the congressman alluded to earlier about this bridge, the Cross Bay Memorial Bridge, uh, hundreds of thousands of people come to Rockway using this bridge and that godforsaken toll. But for them to come over this bridge, and the first thing they see is a closed beach. So that welcome sign that welcomes people to Rockway might as well be a do not enter sign. It is unacceptable that they first, the first beach they see when they come to Rockway to visit is closed. And I, and I do think this is unacceptable. And I, you know, I know many of my constituents say, this would never happen in Coney Island. This would never happen in other parts of the city. And so part of this discussion is we, er, we respectfully request that Rockway be treated just like any other shoreline in the city. Uh, the state closures, uh, closures are not only detrimental to the visitors who come to Rockway, but also to the businesses. Uh, the businesses that were not warned at all about the closing, closing of the beaches. Um, and this local economy that depends upon these open beaches is certainly uh, at a detriment as well. Uh, so I do believe that there is a way to reopen these beaches this summer. Collectively, by working together on every level of government, I do believe there is a way. Uh, whether we need to capitalize on the fact that the Army Corps of Engineers is doing work not too far away in Long Island, uh, if we can capitalize on the fact that they are there and, and taking that opportunity to urge them uh, to replenish the sand that is needed to open the beaches this summer. And collectively, we can find a funding formula to bridge that gap of the cost of replenishing the beaches of the sand with the Army Corps coming here, whether it be through the city budget or even state or federal. Uh, going forward, so that we don't find ourselves in this predicament again, uh, going forward for future beach seasons, uh, I would look forward to working with my constituents and the agencies and holding meetings both locally in, the, in Rockaway and certainly hopefully this committee as well, using its authority, that we could figure out in future beach openings that we aren't faced with this situation again. To get a call four days before the beach opening season to say that there are closed beaches due to erosion, which doesn't happen overnight. So hopefully as we go forward, we can have these meetings well before the beach opening season uh, to avoid this situation. And as I mentioned, my constituents being part of that meeting or those meetings, if these constituents were heard after Sandy, six years ago, if these residents were heard, we might not be in this situation because their plea for groins and for jetties have been ignored. But yet my residents who know far more than us about beach life and what happens on the beaches, if they were heard, we might not be in this situation. So I'm hopeful their voices are heard going forward. I am hopeful that the authority given to this committee can be heard as well as we work together as we go forward uh, to once again, like I said, salvage this summer season. We know the Army Corps is planning to work in the Rockaway beaches 2019, 2020, but we live in the now and we have a situation that, are, that is facing us now and I think as elected officials on every level, we can work together to find some way to salvage this summer season, 2018. Um, I thank you to all the partners as we work together, and I thank this committee for their time and the opportunity to give testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and thank you to all. Um, really, I have had the honor of working with the residents of the Rockaways uh, for going on a really, really long time, but especially after Sandy. Um, uh, in many roles that I've had at Borough Hall under three great borough presidents, including the one that we have here today. Um, they've all been champion of the Rockaways. They've all been champions of parks. Uh, I know that the borough president wanted to make, uh, just add to her statement. So, uh, you know, I was getting over the security thing downstairs. You're getting over the security. So, uh, 
Just, just very quickly, I, I do want to just make an acknowledgement of the community board and all of the civic associations that have worked so hard over the last five years. You know, we would not be where we are without them. Through the changing leadership in uh, the borough president's office and the mayor's office, all of that, we would not be sitting here today talking about these problems. Uh, we would be talking about much greater problems uh, were it not for them. Um, not that you want to belittle what we're doing, but really they've done a yeoman's job in keeping um, the faith out there and also working hard. I do want to thank Councilman Ulrich, Councilman Richards for the work that they do uh, out in the Rockaways and for their constituents. Um, and just as a point of information, Mr. Chair, we also want to make sure that the um, Parks Department uh, talks a little bit about what's happening to the rest of the peninsula, right? Because we hear a lot about the tourist areas um, and there's, that's great, but there's also a lot of areas that are protecting homes, right? And Ponds at Beaver Point, Fall Harbor, all of the Thornton down in Fort Rockaway. And we want to make sure that um, we know what type of studies are being done on those beaches so that we don't have closures over there as well. Just a point of information. And Andy King, you're from the Bronx, but if you want to move to Queens, as long as you don't <laughs> run against someone for council or for borough president, we're okay with that. <laughs> you know, since you're going to wear the colors. <laughs> so. We thank you. I and got the Mr. colors Ch on too. I Mr. Chairman, the, uh, thank you for your work for the for three Queensboro presidents uh, and for your work in the council. You were, in fact, the first person to text me when they announced the closings of the beaches in the Rockaways and said, we're going to do a hearing, and we appreciate that support. Thank you, Borough President. I, I thank you also for um, bringing up the role of the community board, and I, I remember the words uh, the morning after Sandy, John Gaska, who has been the district manager out there, I think since I was in grade school, but um, he said, uh, you know, 25 years at that time, how long he had been there, work is undone overnight. But we have made uh, great strides. The people of the Rockaways are incredibly resilient. We know that. Um, those of us who've had the time and the pleasure to work with them on a myriad of issues over the years know how tough they are. Uh, they're true New Yorkers in every sense of the word, and they're on the front lines of defense when it comes to uh, our shoreline. Um, I believe at this time, uh, Councilman Richards um, would like to make a little statement. Sure, and I'll be brief. And I want to thank you, uh, Chair Gradenchik, not Garodnik, uh, because I think— Don't start that, please. <laughs> and certainly uh, when, when this is announced, you know, one of the first calls that Eric and I got was from you, and I want to thank you for your leadership in holding this hearing today. Um, just a few points on— uh, and, and although I don't represent this section of— the Rockaways, I just wanted to make sure that I, it was important that I was here to stand in solidarity with my colleague Eric Ulrich because what affects the West End also affects the East End. And as I spoke to the Commissioner about this um, earlier last week, you know, this is about process as well. And we want to ensure that communities have enough uh, of a window to adjust in the event of climate change. This is not going to be the last conversation on beach erosion, on the effects of climate change across our city. And I think it's critical that communication is given in advance. I don't know if we're looking at bills in relation to, to reporting on uh, specifics around beach closures, but I'm hoping that we're going to seriously look and entertain some pieces of legislation that I think could prevent something like this from happening um, in the near future. I also want to talk about the inequities and um, that we've uh, certainly witnessed as you look from east to west, well, from west to east, but we have around 50 or 60 blocks of beaches, beachfront property that is currently closed, and I definitely get the sensitivity around the piping plovers, but I also understand that, you know, as a representative of the eastern portion of the Rockaways, how this has hurt the economy, uh, certainly for the eastern portion. And yes, there are some great things that have happened, um, and I want to give a lot of credit to our commissioner who's invested a heck of a lot of money um, into the Rockaways, into our park infrastructure. But I think that this conversation is such a critical one, and I don't want us to get just blindsided by talking of this portion of the beach and not talking of the injustices that we've faced for the last 40 years on the eastern end when it comes to uh, protections and as well as ensuring that um, there are amenities and other things along the eastern portion of the peninsula as well. So I'm hoping that this is going to lead into that conversation of looking at the permitting. I know Army Corps is here today and we look forward to having a deeper conversation about how we can ensure that um, one, economically we can 
um, see some justice finally on the east end, but two, what that protection looks like as we as we move further along um, the peninsula. So I want to thank everybody, thank the community board. I see Hank, I see uh, John Corey here, I see many of the leaders who've led this fight, and I thought it was just important to stick my head in to show solidarity with you. So look forward to a future conversation on this. Thank you, Councilman Richards. Um, we're going to hear a few words now from Councilman Eric Ulrich, who uh, represents the affected section of Beach that uh, we have been talking about today. Uh, he has been joined by his assistant. <laughs> so My boss. If you could introduce her as well, I would appreciate put that on the record, Councilman. Right, Lily? Okay, she's a little shy. She's a little quiet. I don't know who morning. she gets that from, not me. Yeah. But um, uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, my colleagues in government and Commissioner, thank you for being here today. Uh, this is a very important hearing, uh, and as you can see, so many of my constituents and civic leaders have taken the day off. Uh, some of them are retired, some of them are not. You know, they, they took a day off of work to be here because they really care about their communities. And this is an issue that is deeply personal to them, and because it's so important to them, it's important to me, and it's important to us, and, uh, and I don't think that can be understated. So um, I'm a little disappointed, and I, and I, I just want to get this on the record to say, in, in the lack of communication, a lack of transparency, and, an, and in the process. All right, so this is just a statement. It's not necessarily something that I'm asking the Parks Department to respond to necessarily. You know, one week before the announcement, we had an executive budget hearing. And, I ha and we had two rounds of questions, and I asked questions in both rounds, and Commissioner uh, Silver and uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Liam Kavanaugh uh, responded to those questions. And I was asking about suntan lotion dispensers and dog poopy bags and all the other things that my constituents were bringing to my attention. I, I was not aware at the time that the Parks Department was about to uh, announce that, you know, more than 10 bo blocks of the most popular part of the beach would be closed. And I, I think it, it, it is a little disingenuous, to say the very least, that they could come before the City Council under oath, knowing full well that a week later they're going to announce these beach closures and not even mention it or, 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 or bring up the erosion issue in any way. So it was almost like everything was fine. So I, I'm really disappointed about that because I learned about it when I got a call from uh, Commissioner Lewandowski, uh, along with the other elected officials, and um, and that is profoundly disappointing to me because I think that the elected officials have been very upfront about a lot of things and and very forthcoming and very supportive of the Parks Department uh, since Hurricane Sandy and even before Hurricane Sandy. My office works very well with Portia Danforth. I think she does an amazing job uh, representing uh, the Parks Department in Rockway, but. You know, these decisions that have been made and are being made are being made higher up on the food chain, if you will. So, um, you know, again, I, I am disappointed. Uh, I know my constituents were really caught off guard, were really frustrated. I know that the Parks Department has some, um, some news to announce today that I, I read about online uh, last night. I'll let them do that. Um, if they already did, okay. Oh, you already did. The borough president did. Okay, great. But, um, you know, the point is that we have a long way to go, and, and I think that um, if we want to repair the bonds of trust that exist between my community, my constituents, and the Parks Department, we need to begin that uh, today, that process today. And I, I'm hoping that the Parks Department is willing to do that because we certainly are willing to do that as well. I have several questions related to the erosion and the studies and everything else. I'll save that until after the Commissioner's testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Ulrich. Um, and thank you to your assistant for being here today. Uh, Congressman? Yeah, let me just, real quick, to both of them, because I also want to compliment both of our councilmen who have been working diligently across, uh, even across aisles here. We need to learn something about that in Washington, D.C. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> and or maybe how, how you can work together. But when you have a common interest and a peninsula that is actually one, uh, and I think that what Councilman uh, Don uh, Donovan, what, what he said, is important. I want to bring this because all of the constituency here understands that in this sense. You know, we had a tour with the Army Corps, and I wanted to, the Army Corps has been working uh, diligently with me and Senator Schumer and trying to provide uh, long-term uh, resiliency to the to the to the uh, to the beachfront as well as the bayside because they're both tremendously important. And what we did, and many of my constituents, because I represent the entire peninsula, they participated in it. We went around the whole peninsula, 
from the bottom, the east end to the west end on the beach side and the bay side so that everybody can see how everything is interconnected. What affects one on that peninsula affects all. And they all looked at the, the shortcomings and what we need to do in the future along with the Army Corps. Uh, and we just need to make sure that that line of communication, and I just wanted to make sure that to my uh, colleagues on the city council that on the federal government with the Army Corps we have to do and take up our responsibility. So it's not about finger pointing to the city parks department or to the Army Corps or someone in the state. All of us have a responsibility to get this done and to get it done right. Uh, and so I just wanted to make sure I'm on the record clear that on the federal government side, along with the Army Corps, we will be working collectively and I will continue to work uh, and communicate with you and I hope that we all will so we can expedite finally a permanent fixture because we do not want to be back here next year where we have the same problem happening all over again. I don't want to be back here on this again because I only get one hearing a month, so i got to be very judicious. Um, I do want to thank you, Congressman, for summing up. Um, this is really about coming together and about doing what is best, um, not just for the beaches in the Rockaway, but for all the beaches that guard uh, our southern border of New York City. And I, I even remember Orchard Beach up in the Bronx, Councilman Joe Nye. So these are all important. Uh, they're not only first-line defense, but they are very, very important for recreation sources uh, for millions and millions of New Yorkers. With that, I am going to release this panel. I thank you for being here today. I thank you for coming, uh, in some cases, all the way from the Rockaways. I know it's a long trip. Um, uh, Mr. Martin, we have been joined uh, by Council Members Ku and Councilman Borelli. Borelli uh, represents a large beach on the south shore of Long Island as well. Staten Island, I'm sorry, that was my, uh, my slip. So uh, would you call the roll again? Council Member Koo. Council Member Borelli. Like clockwork here. Um, I want to thank uh, all you folks for being here today. Uh, this is the best attendance we've had at one of our hearings. So uh, I think Mr. Jonah wants to say one word um, as well. Thank you, Chair, and uh, I just want to echo some of the comments made by my uh, colleagues, uh, as well as uh, the Congressman uh, and the Borough President and Senator. Um, certainly, we need to be more proactive than reactive, and when it comes to these natural resources where th we owe it to the waterfront communities, the families, all New Yorkers, that we get ahead of these things and not wait for these at the last minute surprises that uh, will impact not only those communities, but all New Yorkers. And I hope that we can, moving forward, we'll be more transparent, more aggressive, and more proactive uh, on short-term and long-term commitments that are needed to protect our waterfront communities. Thank you, Man Counts. Thank you, Councilman Joe Nye. Um, it's now my pleasure um, to call the Commissioner of Parks and Recreation for the City of New York, uh, Mr. Mitchell Silver, and the first Deputy Commissioner of the Department, Liam Kavanaugh. And anybody else who might be joining you, if you need more chairs, oh, is there enough chairs there? We're joined, uh, good to see you, Commissioner Lewandowski, as always. And could the young lady on the end identify herself as well, for the record? Sorry, I'm Kate Spellman, Senior Advisor at NYC Parks. Thank you very much. Uh, if the clerk will now swear in the panel, and then we can begin with the Commissioner's testimony. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? I do. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you for always being responsive uh, to the needs of 8.6 million New Yorkers when it comes to parks and recreation. Please begin. Good morning, Chair Quidenjic uh, and members of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. I'm Mitchell Silver, Commissioner of New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. Thank you for inviting us to offer testimony today regarding efforts we're undertaking to mitigate erosion at our city beaches. NYC Parks is the steward of 14 miles of beaches, which are open for swimming from Memorial Day through the weekend following Labor Day. Our recreational beaches include Orchard Beach in the Bronx, Coney Island, Brighton and Manhattan beaches in Brooklyn, Rockaway Beach in Queens, and in Staten Island, South Midland, Wolf Ponds, and Cedar Grove beaches. Our city beaches attract millions of visitors every year and serve as an important recreational outlet for New Yorkers. 
so the care and maintenance of our beaches is a top priority for NYC Parks. Last month, NYC Parks announced that swimming access to Rockaway Beach will be closed this summer in an area between 91st Street and Beach 1, 102nd Street in order to maintain a protective dune and keep swimmers safe. As many of you know, following Superstorm Sandy and as part of the Rockaway Boardwalk construction, roughly 100 foot wide berm was installed along the beach that provides strong protection to inland residents. That dune occupies much of the space that was previously available for active recreation in the years before Sandy. This loss of recreational space was compounded by this winter's and spring's harsh weather, which resulted in sharply heightened erosion along this section of the beach. Due to the lack of protective groins, and unfortunately the confluence of factors means that there is simply not enough beach area in this location to safely operate swimming and recreational activities at this time. This was not an easy decision to make, and we understand the community's frustration about the closure. We work through every conceivable alternative to avoid closure and explored many alternative approaches to appropriately uh, staging our beach monitoring and rescue operations along the beach. We closely monitored the condition of the beach from April 30th through May 13th. We took careful measurements of the distance of the toe of the dune and the high and low tide lines to estimate how much space would be available for recreational use. As the start of the beach season approached and the heightened erosion caused by this season's storms became more and more apparent, we ultimately had to make the difficult decision in the interest of public safety, which will always remain our top priority. We will continue to coordinate in close partnership with the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency, with the United States Army Corps of Engineers on their Rockaways reformulation study, the federal government's long-term solution to mitigate erosion and protect our coastline along the Rockaways with new dunes, sand replenishments, and groins, which are necessary to keep sand in place and prevent it from washing away with the tides. We're committed to making sure the U.S. Army Corps uh, will see this work through as soon as possible, and the city has stayed uh, closely engaged with the Army Corps to push this project forward. Last February, Mayor de Blasio and U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer met in Washington with the head of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and secured a commitment to expedite construction of this vital project. It is our understanding that construction for this project will be underway by 2020, if not sooner. The Army Corps will reportedly be sharing its draft report in August followed by a final report in November, and we eagerly await these next steps. Beach replenishment is a complicated and expensive endeavor requiring federal permits and state approval, but the city has had a long and successful history of coordinating with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, who are the primary regulatory entities tasked with oversight of our shorelines. Following Superstorm Sandy, the city took immediate protective measures to address the condition of the beach and boardwalk. The 341 million reconstruction project made the beach wider than ever and rebuilt 5.5 miles of boardwalk, installing retaining walls and adding additional sand. We coordinated closely with the Army Corps in hopes the city's project would dovetail with the construction of the reformulation project originally slated for 2016. Though the Army Corps project schedule has been delayed, they have provided a great deal of vital support for the beach. The Army Corps' most recent beach replenishment project in the section of the Rockaways was completed in 2014 and supplied 3 million cubic yards of sand from Beach 19 to Beach 149 along the Rockaway shoreline. Unfortunately, in the years following the replenishment, several sections continue to experience significant beach erosion most notably along the beach 90s. To assess the severity of this erosion, a marine engineering on-call contract from the city's Economic Development Corporation was utilized to conduct an erosion study in the Rockaways. The report was finalized in November of 2017, and the results were shared with local residents and elected officials. The report found that through sig though significant erosion had occurred in these sections, the beach was wider from Beach 86 to Beach 149 than at almost any time in the last 40 years. 
it also found the overall level of resiliency protection in both beach ninety's and beach one forty's was significantly greater than at any point in the last forty years thanks to the dune that was constructed after superstorm sandy as most local residents were, were well aware we confirmed at that time that a key portion of the beach from beach ninety first to one oh second had severely eroded we prompted which prompted us to examine possible solutions to keep the beach open for the 2018 season regrettably in light of the severe weather earlier this year those alternatives were found to be infeasible which led us to determine that a closure was necessary the rebirth of the rockaway beach after the devastation of hurricane standy is a symbol of the community's strength and determination to move forward so we recognize how difficult it was to even see a small portion of the beach closure. <coughs> However, we cannot forget the 4.5 miles of Rockaway Beach that remains open this season, and we plan to take the opportunity to remind New Yorkers and tourists to come and enjoy the sun, sand, and excitement of the Rockaways this summer. We're working hard to ensure that the local businesses, both on the boardwalk and in the surrounding neighborhood, have a successful season. Our boardwalk concessions are open for business, and we are actively working with them to, de to develop creative opportunities to draw more visitors. We're adjusting our normal rules to permit more live music along the boardwalk earlier in the day, partnering with local organizations to present great programs like the Live and Local Concert Series and morning yoga sessions and engaging with partners like the City Parks Foundation to bring more exciting events to the boardwalk this summer. We're very pleased to see that thanks to the nice weather and successful public engagement to date, the recorded attendance so far this beach season in the Rockaways is close to 1.2 million visitors compared to just over 600,000 over the same period last year. And our beach concession ha concessions have seen a 35% increase in revenue compared to the same period in 2017. And we're pleased to share that starting next weekend, we will open a popular section of the beach for swimming between Beach 96 and Beach 98th Street, directly in front of Parks Concession. We'll be doing this on a trial basis in order to closely monitor the operation to ensure our ability to keep beach goers and swimmers safe. To help educate beach visitors, Parks has installed signage clarifying where the beach is accessible and is available and where concessions are located. Our agency partners at Small Business Services have offered their support to local businesses, and we are finalizing a citywide campaign in partnership with New York & Co. to get the word out that the Rockaway Beach is very much open for business. We would, be, we would be eager to partner with the council and other local elected officials to help us continue to let New Yorkers know the Rockaways are open and remain a fantastic summer destination for all to enjoy. Working alongside the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency to address long-term resiliency issues facing New York City, NYC Parks will continue to work with the Army Corps of Engineers, the State DEC, to enhance our shoreline protection for the Rockaways. NYC Parks will continue to maintain and invest in our 14 miles of beaches throughout the city, working with our city, state, and federal partners to maintain and enhance these wonderful settings for outdoor recreation to benefit local, residents and visitors to New York City's shorefront. Thank you for allowing me to testify before you today and for all of your advocacy for New York City Parks. We'll now be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you before this committee. Um, I am going to ask a few questions and then I'm going to turn it over first to, uh, well, we'll decide who goes first. I'll leave that to my colleagues from the Rockaways. Um, I want to get right to the point, though. Um, we certainly have been aware of the erosion and the severity of the erosion. Um, this is no surprise to anybody. Can you tell me why it took so long to let the community know that this was going to happen? Was it, was it that you were hoping to keep the beach open and it just didn't happen? Or can we get to that right away? Because I think that's on everybody's mind. Well, first let me say that while we consistently engage the public and elected officials and stakeholders on the erosion issue, uh, we do regret that not being explicit with the public that the closure severely eroded sections of the beach uh, was a legitimate possibility. Uh, we should not have assumed uh, that possibility was understood. 
So from that point of view, uh, that is something I will concede. We will make sure we're very explicit going forward. There was an erosion study back uh, in June of 17. At that time, uh, we uh, had agreed to conduct a study. That study uh, was completed in November of 2017. And at that time, uh, we shared with the public that, as I stated in my testimony, uh, the beach had never been wider than the last 40 years. And the city's investment in that betterment to put in that dune had actually helped uh, with uh, subsequent storms. But it did reduce the recreational area. The report did suggest that we need to look at some areas of concern. Uh, as time went on and we looked at the possibility of replenishment, uh, trucking sand in was not a possibility. That endeavor would take well over 18 months at a cost of 50 million, and in terms of a dredge being available, continued to be a moving target. And so we continued to monitor the situation, and between April 30th and May 13th, we started to measure the beach itself, uh, and that's when we determined at that time, after May 13th, that there was not sufficient sand. We believe we can operate the beach safely. So it was about eight days later when we looked at every conceivable option, it was determined that we could not find an alternative to keep the beach open safely, and that is when we decided that the beach had to be closed but between 91st and 102nd Street. Now, you just announced um, in your testimony that, and <coughs> we've read this, but uh, um, I just want to go over it again, that we will have an open section between 96, Beach 96 and Beach 98th Street right in front of the parks concessions there. And what did you have to do to make sure that the, the bathing public is safe? I know that it's a very popular section, um, and I just wanted to, uh, to maybe you could share those details. We explored that alternative uh, as well as other sections during the, after between May 13th and May 21st, we made the announcement. Uh, and so uh, we met with the Civic, the Rockaway Civic Association. They brought up a number of ideas, including this one. We decided to take a second look. We went out with Commissioner Kavanaugh, lifeguard leadership, I have to thank them, uh, Park Enforcement Patrol, NYPD. It is to still a small area, but it's directly in front of the concession. And we wanted to make sure on a trial basis that we can see if, in fact, we can open up that portion for swimming. We concluded we could, uh, but we want to be clear it's going to be done on a trial basis. We do not want the lifeguards distracted. We want to make sure that all the beachgoers uh, follow uh, the park rules. Uh, and so we will uh, analyze it on a week-by-week -week basis. We're also going to have to put board to explain people when high tide will occur. Uh, it could happen during the day, it could happen in the evening, so mm -hmm. people have to know, although it is open for swimming, because it's such a small section of the beach, there is a, no protected dune per se in front of the concession that we will have to close that beach during that time period, which could be before the 6 p.m. closure when the lifeguards are on duty. You also arranged, uh, have you worked with the MTA to make those announcements? Sometimes you can't hear announcements on trains, but that's another hearing. But um, it would be helpful so people know where to get off the train uh, because if they're going to that spot and it's not open, you'll have a lot of disappointment. So if you haven't done so, I would ask that um, your public relations people contact the MTA's people so we can make well, those announcements. Starting June 30th, that section will be open. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot communicate when the high tide is that day unless someone looks online or there will be boards in front of the, there are, it's an easier control section. You have a sand area in front of the concession. You have one other access point. We want to communicate that the Rockaway is open for business. And if that section is not open, it is not a far walk to an open section. So our goal is to communicate that Rockaway Beach is open for business. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, the concessionaires who, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see, it's astonishing to me that we've doubled the number of visitors, uh, at least for year to date. And maybe the weather was bad last year, I don't know, although it hasn't been so great this year um, uh, on the weekends. Um, has anything been done to help those concessionaires uh, where the beach is closed? Yes, uh, we're doing a number of things uh, for uh, the 97th Street concession. Uh, we provide a 50% rental deferral to our concessionaires. We've given concessions permission to host live music earlier in the day uh, than is normally approved starting at 1 p.m. We've added greeters to the impacted areas to help guide visitors to the concessions. We've installed signage reminding visitors that concessions are open 
we put together a robust program, and I have to really commend both City Parks Foundation and, and Portia and the Queens team for really coming up with an amazing assortment of programming to help draw people to that location. Uh, we've allowed for bike rentals adjacent to the ferry landing. We are executing a citywide marketing campaign to remind New Yorkers and tourists that the Rockaways are open this beach season. So we're, we're still open to do more, but you'll now see the banners when you go out there that talk about the programming throughout the summer. Uh, and it's something I'm very pleased that uh, will enhance uh, the Rockaway experience for our visitors and New Yorkers. I want to go back. Um, I'm going to take one quick moment because is Billy here? Oh, Billy's here. I want to welcome uh, Councilman Moya, and I just want to take a very brief um, break in your testimony uh, because Councilman Moya is chairing his own hearing today of the Zoning and Franchise Subcommittee. So, um, Mr. Martin, if you could. Uh, Continuation roll call committee on parks, Council Member Moya. I and all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, ca uh, uh, Chair Moya. Final vote on both items now stand at 11 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk Martin. Thank you, uh, Councilman Moya. Uh, I'm going to head back to a few more questions and I'm going to turn it over to the two members from the Rockaways. Um, was any of what happened? Um, in your decision-making process, uh, how much effect did the Army Corps of Engineers have on this and how much consultation did you do with them? We have ongoing conversation with the Army Corps, but our primary focus has been the long-term solution. As I stated in my testimony, uh, dredging was an option, uh, but that was always a moving target, and so we, our attention here at the city was to focus on the long-term solution. And the Army Corps, I have to say, have been great partners. Uh, we've maintained a relationship with them. Uh, and so I think there was even concurrence that uh, trucking in the sand was not a viable option, how it would disturb the beach itself. Uh, so they were aware throughout the process, uh, and that relationship will be ongoing as we look at the long-term solution. Um, and I, I'm familiar with the Rockaways. I'm not as familiar as the people who live there, obviously. And I just, I want to ask you, um, um, have these closures occurred in the recent past? I don't, I don't know what the collective memory is. I know that obviously after Sandy there was, uh, we had to rebuild the whole beach, but I just wanted to know if there'd been any, I know there was a, a closure one June uh, Saturday in, uh, in 2014 when I was working for Borough President Katz at that time. But that was not, uh, that was a, a technical difficulty, as we like to say. Would there have been any other closures? Well, I, I will defer to Commissioner Kavanaugh, who has an amazing encyclopedic mind, has he been is here a very, longer very than all of man. us. Uh, I do know, as Councilmember Don uh, Richards has stated, uh, for the piping plovers, due to federal requirements, there are closures there. And as you stated, uh, for the construction itself, uh, for the boardwalk, there were some closures. But I will now defer to Commissioner Kavanaugh. Uh, specifically for erosion, there have been no closures in my memory uh, on Rockaway Beach. Okay. Any other beaches in the city? Uh, about 10 years ago, we had to close portions of Orchard Beach because of extensive erosion. The impacts were very different. It exposed a, a layer of rock and substrate that was very difficult for people to use the, the water. Okay. Um, my last question for now, um, what is the latest estimate on how much sand is needed to replenish this closed section of Rockaway Beach and um, the cost estimate as well, if you have it? Uh, it's about 300 cubic yards. The uh, 300, 300, thousand, sorry, 300,000 300 cubic, 300, yards, cubic yeah. yards. And the estimates vary, could be anywhere from 10 to 15 million. Okay. Um, Erosion, Coney Island, a problem now, as I understand there may be a little uptick in erosion, or you want to talk to that? Uh, we, we have not seen, uh, erosion is an ongoing process, we are all aware of that. We have not seen significant erosion impacting the beaches in Coney Island. Uh, we do a survey of the shoreline twice a year since 2015, uh, and the shoreline in Coney Island has remained remarkably intact. And 
Um, the difference between the Rockaways and, and uh, Coney Island, uh, you have groins, breakwaters. I, I'm not as familiar with Coney Island. I've, Councilman Traeger has promised me uh, a visit there, and I will be there hopefully soon. But um, is there a difference between the two beaches? There, the there is a, vi uh, a major difference. There are groins throughout uh, most of Coney Island Beach. Uh, but I think the, the, the major factor is that Coney Island is sheltered to some extent by the Rockaway Peninsula. <laughs> Rockaway is fully facing the Atlantic Ocean and absorbs the full force of that ocean. Uh, Coney Island does not see the same level of, of waves uh, and uh, sort of high, high surf that we can often And they're taking the sand, because I know the flow on the South Shore of Long Island is from East, east to west. East to west. So they're getting the sand. I have to have a talk with the people in Brooklyn about that. Okay. Um, at this time, I am going to uh, forego some questions and going to ask if these two gentlemen flip the coin. Oh, you're right. Okay. Who well, when, when you work with, your, with, with a colleague as great as Eric Ulrich, you know, it's not about ego. I guess you're, go about I guess you're going us, first, so. Councilman Richards. So. <laughs> <laughs> Councilman Richards, and, As you see, and we, I'm gonna cross, we cross party lines on a lot of things. In this first yeah. round, I'm going to ask for a five-minute clock. <laughs> Are you sure? Thank you. Why, are you going to put the clock on when I go? Okay. I'll put it on uh, when he goes, too. Uh, and I Don't neglected worry. to acknowledge the great work of uh, Commissioner Lewandowski and, and Porsche as well, who's really been great. And I want to acknowledge them for the work that they've done to bring equity um, to the entire peninsula when you're talking about uh, park access. But there still is this question around um, uh, access to the beachfront. And I, I did hear that there was uh, a new um, – uh, when it comes to piping plovers, that there there may be a new classification from uh, when it comes to the piping plovers from endangered to protective species. So, what would that entail when you talk about permitting um, for for uh, the eastern end? And I keep bringing this point up because, um, as you know, about the disparities that exist uh, for a long time prior to this administration, so to no fault of your own. Um, but we are dealing with 40 or 50 blocks of beachfront that is closed, which has really had an adverse effect on the economy of the eastern end of the peninsula. So I, I just want to hear a little bit more about that. And then secondly, I, I know that you spoke of some work you're doing for the small businesses uh, in, uh, in the 90s, wanted to know what the coordination between uh, Department of Small Business Services looks like as well as, as you go through this. So is there any coordination there as well? I'll let Commissioner Kavanaugh ask the first part of the question. I'll respond to the second one about okay. reaching out to local business okay. owners. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware that the uh, Federal Fish and Wildlife Agency is considering um, changing the designation for plovers from endangered to protected, but if it were to happen, it would result in probably less strict regulations covering the plovers. And, you know, we do use a variety of different approaches to the plovers. Uh, there is a, a section between 38 and 58 that is entirely closed because of the large population of plovers that have been returning from year to year there. But we do have sections both in the 20s, the 30s, and the 60s where we're able to cordon off relatively small sections of the beach for the, plover, for the plovers and allow other activities to, con to continue, whether it's fishing, sunbathing, swimming, surfing, mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. Well, none of that is happening now on my side. So, oh, it, so it, it is in the so, 20s so and 30s. We do have small well, sections that further are Further 20s, but I'm talking more in the mid-section. In the mid, in the, in the 38 so we, to 58 is closed. Yeah, so we have closed. 20 blocks closed of yes. the front. And that's because yeah. it has become a, a very significant breeding ground for the plovers, and they're, they're right at the shoreline in many cases. Uh, and, you know, we do have an obligation under federal regulation. Yeah. But if I'm also... If I can just indulge a little bit further, is there not pipe, piping plovers further to the west with a narrower beach as well? There are, or but am they I confused about Yes, that? there are okay. plovers to the west in the 60s. Uh, they are not, uh, they, 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 the colonies aren't as large as we see, 38 to 58, and we are able to protect them by using small, um, uh, small enclosures to keep the people uh, and machinery away from the plovers. We've been able to do that for the last few years. Uh, and so has there been any, so you're saying that they're breeding a little bit more, has there been any thought between 38 and 58 to sort of help guide them to 
uh, being enclosed a little bit more. Uh, we, uh, we're not allowed to do too much guidance when it comes to moving. We're not allowed to move the birds right. around at all. But what's the coordination between wildlife and parks on this? And oh, I know the permitting process is now up, correct? Yes, we, okay. we, we work very closely with them. We review our procedures and processes at the start of the season. We report to them on the level of, of breeding activity that we see. Uh, right, but when the have they been out to the beach? Uh, with you is that done jointly or is it just the parks department giving their recommendation no i know they have been out at the beach with us i can't say at what frequency okay. and when their last visit so i appreciate they, some they follow up on this commissioner because i think there there's an opportunity here um and i think you know for my portion of the beach which has been closed you know and people like to point to high unemployment and all of these things it's had an adverse effect on the economy centered in the most dense part of the Rockaways, and where every disparity <laughs> in the Rockaways exists, whether it's health care, whether it's unemployment, and I hate to, you know, I don't want to say beat, keep beating on the pike and clover issue, um, but it, it really is an equity issue at this point, and we need to have further conversations. So I'm grateful and I'm happy to be here to support, once again, uh, Council Member Ulrich and his endeavors but I also am interested in having a longer-term conversation, short-term, God willing, but longer-term conversation, how we ensure that there's equity to the beachfront uh, on the east end as well. To answer your question about the local business owners, I'll do this very quickly because of time. Uh, we have a comprehensive signage program, agree to program uh, to inform beachgoers. Uh, we have now new robust programming uh, and we want to communicate the beach is open. That's the hardest message is people are saying a section, the beach is open. Right. And so we also have beacon technology as an example of how we're mm -hmm. working uh, with the Rockaway Business Alliance that will be informative kiosks on the beach itself, mm -hmm. working with SBS with their support, and as I mentioned, we're finalizing a campaign with New York and Company. All right. Awesome, awesome. I was going to bring that up. And I would, I would argue because if someone said to me the other day, isn't your beach closed? They, there's this perception that the entire beach is closed. So I don't know what you can do PR-wise. Well, I don't know if it's another ceremony. I don't know what it is. Well, part of the emotion behind gonna, closing a portion yeah. of the beach is that the messaging is that the beach is closed, the beach is closed. Uh, even the day that we opened on uh, in right before Labor Day, our message was the beach is open as a small section, right. but that's being lost. But there needs to be more done on that because it's going to have adverse, adverse uh, effects on the economy this summer. So thank you. Look forward to working with you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Richards. Councilman Ulrich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, uh, again, thank you for having this very important hearing. I have so many questions, so I, I, I'm going to try to get to them sort of one at a time. And I, my statement is already a matter of record, so I don't need to rehash that. The study that the uh, EDC and the Parks Department uh, conducted um, last year that was public, that you got the results in November, how much did it cost? Uh, approximately two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, two hundred thousand dollars. And I, 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 Liam, I remember um, that you were actually at that hearing last year when we had the joint hearing with the mayor's office of housing recovery. The Army Corps was there, and you were there. And I was just pounding them on this particular subject with respect to the uh, the study. You know that you know how long was the night? When did the ninety days start? When was it going to end? When were we going to get the results? So. Was the decision made to close Rockaway's beaches made in November when you got the determination of the study? No, no. no. Okay. The determination was made uh, after May 13th when I got the report back about measuring the beach. It was made at that time. Okay, so between no what had changed between November and May 13th? You're saying that the winter storms had resulted in, in worse erosion than we had expected? Well, we always knew it was a possibility, uh, but it was... It, it was the storms that after the storm we did our measurement uh, between April 30th and May 13th, and that's when we knew that there was severe erosion due to the storms, and that's when we had to make that decision at that so time. So who, who made the decision to close the beaches in Rockway? Was it yourself? Were there other agencies involved? How was that decision made? We always coordinate with other agencies, <laughs> but it clearly it's our recommendation along with occurrence of others. Uh, based upon the fact that we went out there to measure, it was our recommendation that went forward. So ultimately, it was my primary recommendation supported by other agencies. And then the mayor himself made the decision? 
I say the mayor made the decision. Uh, clearly, we consulted all partners, such as uh, we always consult our partners, but ultimately it was my decision. Okay, so it was your decision to close the beaches, and you made that decision after May 13th ba in consultation with other agencies based right. upon the reality of the severity of the beach erosion which had occurred. Did the uh, lifeguards have anything to do with this? Absolutely. The lifeguards did. So we did the did lifeguard uh, uh, union uh, recommend that the beaches also be closed? The conversation happened is that we wanted to find out how we can safely operate the beach. We looked at many alternatives, including the one that we are looking at a small section we're opening up. Uh, we checked with Commissioner Kavanaugh, working with the lifeguards, to see if there's a way we can operate the beach safely uh, between 91st and 102nd Street. We had a lot of concerns, uh, and so we seek their input, but ultimately that decision was mine. And their input was um, in agreement with yours. So they're basically that, that those beaches should be closed. They expressed concern about keeping the beachgoers safe in that section. What, what consideration was given to the berm? I know that the uh, city was very, and in your testimony you mentioned the right. berm that the city had put into place as a temporary protective measure uh, until the Army Corps right. plan fully goes through, but um, what consideration was given to the berm in terms the berm of was part of the consideration. Uh, concern the about the water damaging the berm or people no, damaging people, the berm? people, as oh. they see the high tide coming, people will retreat onto the protective dune. That dune is there to protect both people and property. And so the concern is that uh, as the high tide is coming, you probably know the beach very well, some sections are quite narrow, uh, that people then retreat to the dunes. And that is an element that we certainly want to make sure is protected because that keeps people and property safe. So, you know, we had the mayor, I'm going to wrap up as quickly as I can. We had the mayor at a town hall in November. You were there. It was a very good town hall meeting. I think he was well received. Prior to that uh, town hall meeting, we had impressed upon the mayor the importance of the erosion issue, not only downtown in the beach 90s, but also uptown. And, and the mayor sort of assured us that he was going to work with the Army Corps, try to get them to expedite it, but that he didn't. He was being advised by the Parks Department not to commit any funding to sand replenishment because at the time he didn't think that it would result in beach closure. Is that? No, I can't say that's accurate. At the time when we were, were putting ourselves at the town hall, uh, we were looking at the option of sand by trucking it in. That seemed to be an unacceptable option, both by cost and by the operation of trucking in sand. Secondly, as I mentioned in my testimony, that the beach replenishment through dredging was a moving target. We knew a dredge was coming, but we didn't know when. <laughs> We advised the mayor that the best thing to do is continue to pursue a long-term option with the Army Corps. He then went to Washington and agreed to go to Washington to <laughs> pursue that. And it's my belief that the Army Corps is now receptive to seeing how they can expedite that timeline. But our focus was the long-term solution. Okay, I have one last question because I know the bell's about to ring. Um, is Neponset next? Neponset and Bell Harbor. Are there currently plans to close their beaches later in the season or next season? Can we expect anything? I, I'm talking to the chair now about introducing a bill that would require the Parks Department to give 30 days notice, not one week's notice for beach closing. That's something that we're going to be discussing well, you know, internally. But are there plans to close any other beaches in Rockaway anywhere in the near horizon that we need to know about right now? There are no plans at this time. We're watching carefully the beach 30s, the beach 130s, and the 140s. Uh, clearly, as a result of what has transpired the last six months, uh, we're going to give full, full information about what is happening to some of those beaches so that the public is aware. But we're watching those locations, and we'll make sure we figure out how to do uh, more regular updates to the public so that they're aware, particularly as we're looking at the 2019 beach season. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Ulrich. Uh, Councilman Andrew Cohn, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I really, uh, I know Councilman King outed himself as with his affinity for Queens, and uh, um, as my colleagues know, I actually grew up in the Rockaways as, you know, from the, my parents brought me home from the hospital pretty much, and uh, until I graduated Beach Channel High School, so I, I know the area very well, uh, and um, I, I have to say I, I'm surprised that, that the report, the 2017 report says that the beaches have never been, had never been wider because as some, you know, as an eyewitness, I can tell you that is just factually incorrect. The beaches are, you know, were severely eroded last year. I've, spent, I've managed to spend some time, as my, as my tan will show you already, this year. And the beaches are obviously severely eroded this year. But it's not, you know, there's no new information that we got between 2017 and today. 
uh, about the s really severe beach erosion situation there. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I don't know if you should get your two hundred thousand dollars back, but that that information is just plain factually incorrect. There really is a, a ongoing severe erosion problem there. Um, so uh, I do want to uh, give uh, the the Parks Department uh, credit where credit is due, though. I, I do have to say, and I can see the beach from my house, and. Uh, uh, it, you know, they do yeoman's work keeping it clean. It's, it's amazing out there that they're raking every day. The new boardwalk, I think, is amazing. Uh, the, I didn't get a chance to thank the borough president for funding the many concerts that, that people get to enjoy out there. Uh, but really, um, I, I, it, it just can't be a surprise that, uh, that this is uh, that, that the, the condition that the beaches are in. And as Councilman Ulrich, you know, uh, I have friends, uh, you know, I go visit in Neponset. The beach there is, you know, is, is a wisp. It's just a narrow spit. I don't see how that's tenable going forward. So I really think that while we wait for the Army Corps of Engineers, I think that there does need to be an interim solution. Uh, Councilmember Cohen, to clarify what I said earlier, uh, the beach is wider because a portion of the beach as a replenishment and the betterment uh, that portion now that was primarily used prior to Sandy for recreational use is now a protected dune. So the recreational portion is what is smaller, uh, and that's where you do have the erosion. Clearly having the groins there will address that issue. So if you look at what the study did at the totality of the beach, it is wider than it's been for 40 years, but a good portion of it is now with the protected dune. I, I, I don't want, it's not, a, you know, I don't want to debate you here, but I, I, I'm telling you, as I understand, I understood your testimony. I walk over the dune to the rest of the beach, and from the wall to the ocean is significantly narrower than it was before um, <coughs> w when I was growing up, you know, and in years past before Sandy. So it, there really, is that, again, I don't think that that information is just factually correct, that from the wall to the water is shorter <coughs> now than, than, I, than I recall in my lifetime. So that is... You know, my impression, I can't say that I took, uh, took measurements, but uh, I really have spent a fair amount of time there. So <coughs> as an eyewitness, I can tell you that I don't believe that that information is correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, thank you for joining <coughs> us and for your expertise uh, on the Rockaways. I'm learning things today. Um, Commissioner, does the city have a... a you know, it's almost unfair, but the parks, uh, the beaches fall under your jurisdiction. Um, and we've talked about three major uh, areas today, uh, Orchard Beach also, <laughs> but Orchard Beach not really being the absolute first line of defense, with all due respect to my colleague, uh, Mr. Jonai. Um, but the Rockaways and the Coney Island area and the South Shore Long Island are all uh, pretty much, with, with a few exceptions, I know there are some federal <coughs> beaches. Um, but... Um, do we have a comprehensive plan to deal with this, uh, you know, going forward over 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Is, there's an awful lot of people who live on these peninsulas. After, su after Superstorm Sandy, uh, under previous administration, they created uh, the Office of Recovery and Resiliency. They're looking very carefully. Uh, there was a whole plan done before I arrived here about looking at the whole issue of both resiliency and climate change. So the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency in cooperation with many other agencies are looking at the threat and vulnerabilities citywide. And so the answer to the question is yes. Uh, a lot of those efforts and planning projects are well underway from Staten Island to Rockaway to Coney Island and other vulnerable areas in the city. So the answer is yes, there is a plan. Uh, that is something that the Mayor's Office of Recur Recovery and Resiliency is the lead and we support them and agree with their assessment of how to keep New Yorkers safe. Thank you for that answer. Um, the city, uh, obviously we've talked about the replenishment that took place after Sandy. Um, are you the city agency that's responsible for monitoring, I'm not, you know, how much sand is left or how much sand uh, is not left? So wh who's responsible for monitoring the beaches on a, I wouldn't well, say a daily basis, but. I will defer to Commissioner Kavanaugh. I do know that we have staff going out there measuring uh, during the time period, as I mentioned, at the end of April before the beach season, but we're now doing it periodically as well. Uh, I'll defer to uh, uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh to see what other measures from the Army Corps, uh, what their role is in measuring uh, the beach as well. Uh, yes, the Parks Department is responsible for the city's public beaches, and we do periodically measure the shoreline. It is not a, an erosion study per se, but it does measure the 
position of the shoreline at two particular points during the calendar year uh, in the spring and the fall to give an indication of how the beach is performing over a long period of time. And that's really its value is looking over a long period of time. We've been doing it for four years since Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and uh, you know we do use that information uh, to factor into our management of the beach and planning for, uh, for, for a longer term. And is there a threshold it, within the agency that determines whether or not you have a beach erosion problem? Because I'm just, you know, I, I know things change on a daily basis on the shore and uh, the South Shore of Queens, the whole South Shore of Long Island, which Queens is a part of, has been sculpted by, for, for eons. And we've tried to wrestle it to the ground to some extent, but Mother Nature has her own way. And I'm just wondering whether you have within the agency a, a threshold where you, where you would have to say to, to the commissioner or somebody would have to say to you, we got a problem. And how is that determined? I, I can't say we have an explicit threshold, um, but clearly uh, there is you know, a rate at which erosion occurs and its impact on specific beaches that cause us uh, to make decisions such as the one we made earlier in May uh, that it's not popular, but we think is in the best interest of both coastal protection and public safety. Um, in Rockaway, um, it's been well known for, for a long period of time that there are two primary erosion areas in the beach 30s and the beach 90s. Uh, since Hurricane Sandy, the beaches in the Ponset and Bell Harbor have also shown um, uh, more erosion than they had traditionally uh, shown uh, uh, based on what the consultants who conducted the erosion survey concluded that yes, there has been a significant loss of sand in that area, uh, but it is largely due to the fact that the Army Corps overbuilt those beaches beyond what they had normally, uh, the normal size when they replenished the beach after Hurricane Sandy. And most of the loss has been uh, basically the beach returning to its normal profile. Uh, so in the long term, they do not expect that to be a area of significant increased erosion, whereas in the 30s and the 90s, uh, you know, we have been experiencing severe erosion for, for many decades. And uh, that's why the Army Corps plan focuses on making adjustments to the, the groins in those areas to slow the rate of erosion substantially. Do we know where the sand went? I mean, do, do have you show, seen any increases in, in, uh, in other areas? Because, you know, it's a lot of sand that has to go somewhere. Up Is it just laying at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, or actually, you you can see, uh, you know, what they say, what they call updrift of the groins. You do see accumulation and uh, sort of concentrations of sand. For example, uh, east of the jetty at or groin, as they like to call it, at 88th Street, the beaches in that area are significantly wider uh, than those to the to the west, and they hold more sand consistently. Uh, and I think that is demonstrates the. But the flow is. Uh, but the flow I'm, is. I may be missing some. The flow is from from Montauk to yes. the end of, I guess to to New Jersey. Uh, but I, I I'm, I'm straying into territory I shouldn't. Okay. But the, the groins do trap and hold sand in. Right, place, that I get, and I've it. seen that at West End Two Beach. At you know to keep that channel open, I think it's Reynolds Channel, and it's amazing how big that beach has become. And if you put yes. if you put something there, it's going to hold the sand. And I guess that's why we, we would like to have groins. But I'm just wondering, and I don't want to get too, too much into this. But, but yes, but the, I, th I think that's an example of, of how groins can work to hold sand and keep beaches intact over long periods of time. It is the downdrift side of the groin where you see the severe erosion. You see it in the 90s. And if you look at Reese Park west of the 149th Street groin, you'll see a, a similar phenomenon there where the beach is sculpted uh, pretty, uh, pretty significantly from in comparison to our beach east of 149th Street. I'll take a look. i got to get down there. Uh, Councilman Jonah, do you have a question? Thank you, Chair. Commissioner, can you elaborate a little bit more on the rent delay for those concessions that are impacted by the beach closure? It's not a is basically a 50% rent deferral. So. But you have concessions that, are, that will be in places where the beach is entirely closed, is this what I understand? Not, 
not any longer as of June 30th. The portion, 97th Street, is the one that is within the closure. The other ones are basically outside. <coughs> the, the one at 97th Street is the one that's primarily impacted. Prior to my decision to let it be open for swimming, there was a section of sand that was available because there was no protected dune in front of the <coughs> concession, as well as supplementing additional activities. A recommendation starting June 30th is now to open up that section, a two-block section, for swimming. And so our hope is that it will help. Uh, we'll still continue with the 50% re referral, deferral, uh, because there's still sections uh, that will be closed from 91 to 96, and then 98 to 102. And because it's a temporary measure, uh, have you discussed waiving any rent uh, if the beach in front of these establishments is closed altogether? Well, because it's a concession, we're able to see uh, the income that's gen generating, and we've already noted there's been a 35 increase for all concessions at the Rockaway. As these reports come in with our audit division, uh, revenue division, we'll see exactly how they're performing, but we've already communicated there'll be a 50% rent deferral. And what about extension of contract? Is typically their set with number of years if the beach is closed for a year for them or moving forward uh, to replenish, is there going to be an extension for their... I'm not familiar with that level. It's something I can find out. Uh, is a concern. Uh, you know, many of these concessions uh, take a gamble, if you will, uh, and that would be on turnout, weather cooperating sure. uh, to their benefit and nice weekends. Uh, they have uh, so many hurdles to overcome, uh, and many of them are not in the control of anyone. But certainly this is something that we should be thinking about, uh, extending their contract periods as well as the rent concessions, uh, which uh, hurt many of these concessions, small businesses. Uh, understood. So you know that all of our contracts go to the FCRC. They have a certain term. Uh, it's something we can see what is possible, we can look at, but I cannot commit to anything at this time other than to look to see what is legally possible given the current terms they have with their current concession agreement. Did you want to add something? No, I mean, you know, I would just add that we've been in very, very close touch with um, our concessionaire on the Rockaways to understand what they need from us um, and have been uh, trying to work with them. For example, we've allowed them to uh, bring amenities sort of outside of their um, licensed premises. We've allowed them to, you know, uh, change the hours that they offer uh, live music. Um, you know, so, so we're trying uh, to understand exactly what would be helpful to them and then make that happen to the extent possible. Have they all been receptive to this in the sense of they've agreed, they've committed themselves to, there is no uh, yeah, upset it's, 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 Yeah, no, we have, we, have a, uh, we have a great relationship, and as the commissioner said, we've seen really hopeful signs in terms of their revenue trends so far. Yeah, it's funny that you say they have a great relationship. I'm a little familiar with the concessions program, and I've never heard anyone say they had a great concession. They had a great relationship with parks. Well, we're, make, we're making history here today, changes. I guess. <laughs> we do have a great relationship with our concession. Must be to all to the credit of you, Commissioner. All right. Uh, Councilman Cohn. Commissioner Kavanaugh, just to follow up, because yeah, I was thinking, uh, you know, you know, on the beaches, you see all of the wooden jetties exposed, which you don't normally see. I mean, they're usually a sand almost to the top of the wooden jetties. And as you walk down from, I would say, from the 120s toward Neponset, all of those wooden jetties are now exposed. And like I said, there's always sand there. I mean, isn't that evidence of? Uh, well, uh, y there hasn't always been sand on those wooden jetties. When the Corps replenished the beach in 2013 and 2014, they did cover many of those jetties, not all of them, uh, but did cover them. And now as, as that sand has, has eroded away, the wooden jetties are now exposed again. But I, I believe that pre-Sandy that they were, they were also, the sand was close to the top of those, of those jetties. I, I, I have a different recollection, council member, but I, I, I would not stake my reputation on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Cohn. Thank you, uh, Councilman Jonai. A um, few more questions uh, for the Parks Department. Uh, do you work with anybody outside the agency, scientists, academics, not-for-profits, uh, on, on erosion and um, techniques? I imagine, you know, we have some of the largest public beaches in the world here, and I just wonder if we consult with people outside. As I stated, uh, we now have an Office of Recovery and Resiliency 
and we do believe climate change is a threat and sea level rise to the city. We have a group of experts that monitor our coastal city on a regular basis with plans and reports about how to protect us going forward. And I have to say I'm proud of the city because there are many parts of this country that are in a sense of denial. We are not, and we know it's a real threat. So in terms of our offices that reach out to the experts as an on-needed basis, we do that. Uh, and apart from that, um, I'm sure there are those that volunteer information to share with us, but between both parks, uh, we have the Office of Recovery and Resiliency uh, and other experts within uh, the city. This is something that we do watch very closely because it's a threat to the city going forward. Any uh, techniques that you've used that may, may not have been used elsewhere that you want to share with us, you know, that just things that are working better than others, perhaps? I know it's not, it's a science, but like, you know, it's not an exact science. Uh, it's very, very difficult. And I'm just wondering if there's anything that you'd like to share with us about that. The reformulation study would be the best approach is putting in the groins that will help keep sand in place. Having those reinforced dunes will protect both people and property. And the public has to realize going forward that those protective dunes, it's a new reality that we have to deal with uh, with climate change. So from our point of view, just educa educating the public what climate change looks like is going to be different in Staten Island with possibly earthen levees, raised earthen levees. Uh, Coney Island may be different, so it's a new reality we now have to deal with going forward. So from our perspective, it's educating the public about what the reality of climate change looks like. All right. I think I am done, gentlemen. Can <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, not about the erosion. I, I just also want to point out, um, r in regards to the dunes, there's a number of places where I think the kids have burned to protect the fencing, and there, there, there needs to be, uh, there are uh, significant gaps in there, and I, I think it's not in anyone's interest to have people walking through the dunes. So uh, please let us know. I know that we're up and down that boardwalk on a regular basis. And I think it it's also in the, Bell, in the Bell Harbor and the Ponce, I think the kids burn the fences. Uh, seeing Portia and, and, and then um, Dottie shaking their head, we're on it. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, Commissioner, thank you very, very much for being here today. Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh, Ms. Spellman, and your whole team. I would appreciate, as you always do, if you could, uh, I know you may be busy, but if you could leave some people behind so that um, the words of uh, the Rockaway residents will be heard by the Department of Parks and Recreation. And with that, I will uh, bid you adieu. Uh, we got to talk about the Mets, though, Commissioner. They do play in a Parks Department uh, stadium. Um, I am now going to call, uh, we've heard from the other elected officials in the community. I am going to call Assemblywoman Stacy Pfeffer Amato uh, for her testimony and so that she won't sit there all by herself, although she's more than capable of sitting there by herself. I'm gonna call Lynn Kelly for New Yorkers for Parks as well, and then we're gonna start to hear from the community. Uh, actually, we're gonna hear um, from the Army Corps of Engineers and then from the community. So, uh, Assemblywoman and... Uh, I don't get a question. You took a good one, Sorry. You took a good one. Uh, it's a good question. Hi, Jim. Next up will be uh, Daniel Fault. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, from the Army Corps of Engineers after we hear from this panel. Okay. Assemblywoman, whenever you are ready. Okay, great. Good morning. You, you've already heard this morning, uh, as you probably know, but I just want you to make sure you know, uh, from the borough president, from Congressman Meeks, and also from your colleague in the legislature, Senator Adamo. Terrific. Thank you. Good morning. Um, to everybody, uh, Barry, to someone, com Chairman, that I know for a million years, I, I know why your name is on the top of the list, so I'm going to call you Chairman Barry. Yes, ma'am. Um, because grabbing a check, I will not be able to uh, say this morning. Butchered it. See, did I butcher? Your mother can pronounce it. I know. Name. So I want to say good morning, <laughs> and I want to thank everyone for being here. It's, I'm not making light of it. It's like a joke. Um, uh, I have formal testimony, but as i just been listening for the few short minutes, I really just want to uh, speak off my hip that I think it's some input that I would like to give. But I have formal testimony, which is basically, I think, going to repeat a lot of what we all have to say. Uh, but yes, already the misinformation was out there in the five minutes that I was here. Yes, the wood jetties were showing in the sand prior to Hurricane Sandy. So what does that say already, which is the, why my whole speech is completely thrown, is that the story keeps changing, except the consistency of the story is the residents, businesses, and local, you know, people that are here today that uh, locally we know best, 
I think it's proven time and time again on issues every community could say that for themselves that uh, the people that are born and raised and spent time and investment in the Rockways community could tell you about our beaches. And the, that is the one um, factor that has been missing from all of this uh, from the time Hurricane Sandy devastated our community till now is still this part of our voices are not completely respected. And I think that's the problem and that's the disconnect with the city um, and a lot of the conversation. This whole conversation, which is about how to protect the city beaches from er um, increased erosion, that question that's here, if I turn to everybody, what's, what would protect us? Groins. So that answer's been out there for 50 years, and I'm 52, I have large print, but it started 50 years ago that everyone knows that was the answer that was given to us, and somehow nobody wants to invest in that. Um, the Army Corps is now taking this approach, and, and they'll finish their study, and they'll get out there, except guess what? We're missing half of our beaches, because they're only committing to 126th Street. And what about the rest of um, the Atlantic Ocean? What about the rest from 126 up to, I guess it's 149? So how can we say, yeah, we get it, you need groins, but only part of the peninsula? So it, even goes, it would go further, really, all the way to Breezy, literally to Breezy. It, and it should, because we'll have the same conversation, because that part of the beaches <coughs> is your taxpayers, is your homeowners, is three generations, is the investment the city has made since Hurricane Sandy. Million, wrong or right, no opinion about the Build It Back program, but millions of dollars have been invested in homes on the peninsula, and the city itself is not willing to invest in their own investment. So we might as well just leave here today and take our tax dollars and throw them across City Hall Park because we're not even investing our own investment. Well, we wouldn't want to do that because uh, as go the Rockaways, as goes Queens, it protects, for one thing, uh, the enormous investment the city, state, and federal government has made at JFK Airport, which is in the tens of billions, if not $100 billion. So. so there's bigger conversations regarding like a floodgate and all that, but if you take the Atlantic side, it's proven. If we're going to talk about groins, it has, the city has to, in a, what is it, $80 billion budget you just voted on? 89.1. Okay, so related, how many yes. dollars were committed to sand replenishment, groins, any sort of beach protection? Because it's not just beach. You know, it's almost like the conversation about flood insurance. When you speak about flood insurance, everyone thinks it's homeowners that own yachts and we live out in the Hamptons. No, flood insurance has to do with our homes on, in Broad Channel, Hamilton Beach, and Rockway. So when we talk about beach erosion and the beaches, everyone has their eyes light up and go, yes, I'm on a yacht and I'm in the beach and I'm dressed in white <laughs> linen. It's not, it's our backyard. It is enjoyment, it's recreation, it's parks. It's also our backyard. It is protection to our homes, the Bell Harbor community. So it has to be a full conversation. And I'm asking the city to put that investment. You know, I, I could say as a, a former assemblyman, Joe and I could say, um, which is perfect that he's on this I'm committee. because he also former assemblyman too. So are you too. But he was, he was the chairman of small businesses, so it's so appropriate that you're here for this conversation, and thank you for defending our small businesses right off the bat. Because as much as the parks can say they have a great relationship with concession owners, um, if they did, they would have known ahead of time they were shutting them down. So there's that answer. Um, but the state, um, you know, myself, I can commit money to a groin. How much does a groin cost? One groin. So $2 million. If I have $2 million of capital money, I'll buy 127th Street. Who wants to take 128th Street? I mean, that's what we're talking about. We're valuing each groin. So we have to figure out how to fund the rest of that project. Because Army Corps says it should be done, but they're only willing to fund with their formula up to 126th Street. So that's the answer of, of, of your part of the hearing. And, and I'll let everyone else speak about that. There's many more who know much more about than I do about replenishment and things like that. The other half of what happened in this conversation um, is what it did to our community and our enthusiasm. You know, four days before Memorial Day to hear that your beaches are closed, and, and I keep using this example, is no different than the city closing down 7th Avenue uh, three hours before the ball drops. Right, that wouldn't happen. We've never would close down an avenue on New Year's Eve, but four days before Memorial Day, what we gear up for, the big start, we close down the beaches. and. What was really disappointing about that when I reached out to call, because my first reaction was the businesses. And I called Small Business Services, uh, the person, you know, our contact, and they didn't know the beaches were closed, closing. So therefore, one city agency did not speak to another city agency, 
which is what happens all the time. And that's the failure. That, to me, is the irresponsibility and where we have to do better. Because if that decision was going to be made, that beaches were going to be closed, like management failed somewhere because you had to be able to say, okay, what does that look like? Or, or call us again. So if you reached out to any of the stakeholders here, we would say, go ahead, please, Sheriff Whitney. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Um, to okay. say, this is what we're going to do and what do you think we need to do? This is what's going to happen. Fact. We didn't like it. It was like taking medicine. But what can we do to make it better? And how can we stop this blow? Because even though we're opening it, and I appreciate those efforts, that we're opening some of the beaches, and, and I felt your pain the opening of that day that you said yourself, your disappointment, your, you were disappointed with yourself. And I feel that from you. I know that. I know you come to our beaches. But a decision like that, we should be having bigger conversations. And, and we should never be in that position again. So for the same effort that the news reported, I mean, I sat there all morning, Channel 7 News kept saying, Rockway beaches are closed, the Rockway beaches are closed. We have to reverse that now and keep telling everyone the beaches are open, all open. And I appreciate the effort that you're going to make with program programming during the summer. But when you pull up to 96th Street, there's a little park thing. One guy sitting at a table like this, his legs out like this, and he's waiting, greeting people. And that's not how I feel about how you greet my beach. And I think we could do better as far as letting everyone know open and what that means. And that continuous plan that you have to talk to the stakeholders about um, has to go on for the Army Corps' plan for three years. Because we're going to be closing beaches for three years to get this replenishment done, and we have to look at what that's going to look like as far as the economics go in the community, communication goes, and, and how that's going to look so people can go to other beaches and get there. So that's the other part of the conversation was the devastation to the economics. And yes, the concession stand, 50% deferred rent, and I appreciate that, but it was the whole beach community that got into a panic, and that's not fair. People, you know, are, are investing their entire income on a good summer. Um, they're trying to expand locally, locally hired young folks, jobs, and people panicked. Hopefully they didn't lay anybody off yet, but what is that going to look like continuous? And though it's up in the concession stand, I still, on a regular basis, even before I left Albany, people say, wow, what's going on? I heard those beaches are closed. So we kind of have to get the message out that Rockway Beach is open. Don't have to say specifically which beach, just we're open. You know, to direct people where to go. We're open. We've been open. We're not closed. And that's what's hard. Because then again, what are we saying? Because well, six beaches, yes, it's the heart and soul of our community. But man, we've worked our butts off since the storm. Each individual civic group, each, you know, business organization, union, Rockaway, you know, um, to get out. And to disclose, I, my husband operates a small business. And it's not for my interest, it's the whole block. I mean, we are a family on Rockway Beach Boulevard and constantly pull on each other of what you know and what you don't know. I could say that small business services did come out after that, trying to talk to the businesses, but most of the businesses feel they won't know the impact to them until maybe at the end of the summer after a full month's a roll. So those numbers could be the concessions number, and I would absolutely thank the community because we've all been out there <clears throat> trying to support, or always have been support, there's nothing better than the concession stand, but we've been out there really trying to make sure that we're visible, that, that everyone can see us and supporting our own community and telling people to come down. So there's, there's two sides to this conversation. Um, one thing I want to touch on that you sort of mentioned was um, the reality of climate change. Not an expert. You know, I was accounting and business major in college. Not my thing. But since Hurricane Sandy, um, we've all got a really quick education. And it's real and it's happening. And there is an Office of Res Recovery and Resiliency, but I'm, I'm disappointed in that office lately. You know, I don't feel any connection or contact, and if that's the state versus the city and we don't all work, but our doors are open. I mean, I am as on the ground in the Rockway Beach community as you can get. And I feel that office could be doing more. And they do have big investments out there. They are in Washington, and I think their voice, are they here today? Are they represented in this conversation? Because they're the experts in this conversation. The Army Corps will be testifying. If no, the you. Office of Recovery and Resiliency, the city's office. Um, no, I'm not expecting them to testify. And they do fall under the uh, sway of the Committee on Environmental Protection Chairman, Costa Costantinis. I will talk to him about it, though. So we, then this should have been a joint, in, in some ways, a joint hearing because it's, it, they line up. And if we keep having this conversation separate, because parks is in charge of that parks and sand, it's their budget. But it's really Office of Recovery and Resiliency that we've dealt with with the core, or we dealt with with um, 
increased, you know, when we talk about flood insurance, and they're that oversight office, and you said it yourself, um, resiliency looks different in each community, what Coney Island does, and that's something else. It's not one big resilient, I dare say, a wall around the city and the boroughs, but everybody's uh, shoreline is different, and therefore everybody has to be treated differently, but once again, it's always Rockaway, and I won't, you know, we're the, the end of the earth, the, um, stepchild and forgotten the not invested in except we do you go there we we know it but it's always we're fighting from the bottom up and i'm tired of it you well I, mean? I i i don't think it's the end of the earth thank you i haven't been to the end of the earth but i know you it's not the rockaways um but it is as as the commissioner pointed out in his testimony it really is the first line of defense for new york city because it's it's the beach that is really closest out into the atlantic um there's nothing separating you know coney island is shielded um, Staten Island's a little further west, of course, and so they don't take the brunt, although both of those communities were also devastated during Sandy. But, um, but we, um, we do appreciate your testimony. I didn't want to cut you off, but I... Uh, no, I'm going to let... That's it. I, I want to okay. say thank you for that. I don't... I want everyone else to speak. It's there. It's really my constituents and the community's words that really... A value the most that's what we're here for uh, that's what I'm waiting to hear as well um, but it's I will say to you on that just on, on last is that please remember what you just said that we are the first line of defense because we're I not remember been treated well. thank you because I that's something that well. has to be flipped in the conversations and uh, thoughts for Rockaway Beach. why we're here today one of the reasons that we're here today I do want to tell you that uh, yeah. I know you were um, a little delayed in uh, getting here um, Commissioner Silver in his testimony uh, did disclose that as they count um, that we have season here to four compared to last year we've doubled so um, while doubled. some doubled the number of visitors so we've gone from 600,000 to 1.2 million which is astonishing uh, to me considering um, how the weather hasn't really been so great it hasn't been that warm at but this point right now yes at this point right apples now to apples, yeah, apples to apples that's what it's in the testimony. I can get you a copy of it. I'll give and, you a copy. Can I ask how that's compared? How that tracking is done? Please, Commissioner. The commissioner, if you would. And the food is excellent. <laughs> I don't... Right. I don't know if any of the concessionaires are with us today, but I can remember being at several beach openings, and right uh, the food is outstanding. So um, get yourself a bread bowl. What I have? It's not just about going on the beach. It's about you know, and, and the Rockaways. To me, it's amazing how far that they've come. And I said this earlier in, in my opening statement that um, the people in the Rockaways are among the most resilient anywhere in New York City and anywhere on Earth. And we know what they've dealt with. Um, I've been there, visiting there, visiting uh, since a little boy, but in government, working with your mother and the other elected officials who preceded you. So I want to thank you for being here today. I know that you're, along with the other elected officials, really have a, a special group in the Rockaways. Thank and you. um, you're a little funnier than your mother also. <laughs> I have to be very Andy's careful. I, I have to be very careful. For those of you who don't know, her mother is the county clerk, and I do not want to end up on a grand jury for six months. So um, <laughs> thank you, Councilwoman, uh, Assemblywoman. I almost gave you a pay raise. Assemblywoman Stacy Pfeffer Amato. I just, I just oh, wanna go ahead. And Eric Ulrich also. Uh, Mr. Joe Nye and then Mr. Well, I, I am term limited, just for the record. You can do whatever so you, you want, never right? know, but. Um, I, I just wanted to say, uh, Chair, on the record, what uh, how reassuring it is for me as, as the city representative here to be joined by all of my colleagues at the federal and state level. That they've, all, they've all came, they've all come here today to testify on the record uh, about this issue, and uh, this is very important. It is very important, and I, you know, I, I know that the state elected officials are working with DEC to look at their permitting process to see if there's parts of that that can be cut out or expedited. That's something that's come up. It really is a group effort, a team effort. We're trying to do everything we can to address the erosion in the Rockaways. Thank you, Councilman Ulrich. Councilman Joe Nye. Thank you, Chair. And I just, for the record, uh, want to say, Assemblywoman, I see the passion in you, and I miss you. And thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. I thank you very, very much, Assemblywoman. Thank you. Uh, Lynn Kelly from New Yorkers for Parks.
Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Councilmember Grudenchik and the committee here on Parks and Recreation. My name is Lynn Kelly. I'm the Executive Director of New Yorkers for Parks. We are a city citywide independent organization committed to research, advocacy, and the promotion of parks throughout New York City. Uh, we too echo the disappointment that many in the room share today that the beach closed and then the announcement came so late prior to the beach opening weekend. Furthermore, we believe that more could have been done to notify elected officials, concessionaires, uh, the community board, and others involved in this process. Um, but we're also aware of what climate change has done in New York City and the difficult response to climate change. The need to dredge and dump sand has been critical since Sandy. Um, this work can only really be completed by the Army Corps of Engineers and approved by the Army Corps. And when winter storms continue to increase at frequency and uh, at rate and severity, it becomes that much harder to keep up. Uh, we appreciate that Parks did make this decision to close the beach for the safety of its residents, um, but we still reiterate that more could have been done to share the news on a more broad scale and to prepare for it in advance. Um, we believe that additional consideration should be paid to the 12 concessionaires at Beach 97th that will be impacted by this closure. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, um, I grew up two blocks from the boardwalk in Staten Island and spent 10 years working in Coney Island directly with um, concessionaires and with boardwalk vendors. I understand how very difficult it is to have a business and it is so seasonal and you make uh, investments based on a year's worth of income into your business but you only get the season in terms of revenue out of it. Um, and I know that firsthand. Um, so marshalling uh, marketing resources, for example, from NYC and Co. is we think is a step in the absolute right dis direction. And Commissioner, um, full disclosure, for many years I've served on the board of New York City and Company. I chair on the executive committee, the Committee for uh, Parks, Recreation, and Attractions. I'd be more than happy to help continue this conversation or marshal resources. This is important, so please turn to me for that, not just in my role at NYC and Company, but my role to help with parks. Um, and we also think it's, it's great that concessions have already been considered as it relates to rents. Um, city may also want to consider hardship grants or waiving some of the standard city contract regulations um, that might leave these concessionaires unable to have profits this season, in addition to, let's say, for example, uh, increasing the hours for music. Um, so with the reality of our changing climate, uh, we urge the administration, the city council, to view this experience as a clarion call for increased funding and coordination with the Army Corps of Engineers so that we can mitigate some of this in the future and hopefully won't have to deal with it any longer. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, Councilmember Ulrich, I will say to you that I give Councilmember Grudenchik a hard time every time I sit up here about every single time about the fact that there are no women on the Parks Committee. So I commend you for bringing the first woman to the Parks oh. Committee today. Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank you. Uh, my, my two great mentors were both women, uh, Assemblywoman Mayerson and uh, Borough President Claire Shulman. Um, I learned a lot from those two great women. Um, at this time, uh, to sit by himself, uh, from the Army Corps of en Engineers, Daniel Fault. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Thank you. I'm all alone here. That's OK. You got the power of the federal government behind yeah, you. Yeah, so. we'll You're all right. Uh, check. Does that work? Yeah. A little water here. Do you have copies of your testimony? Yes, I do. You can give them to the sergeant at arms. Thank you. And I'm gonna, I am going to, as we do with all um, appointed officials, <laughs> I'm going to ask the, um, the clerk to swear you in. Sure. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? I do. Okay, uh, good morning. Thank you for uh, inviting me and allowing me to testify for Thank the Thank you for uh, being uh, here. Uh, my name is Dan Fault, and I'm a senior project manager with the uh, Coastal Restoration Branch, the Army Corps of Engineers, New York District. Pleased to be here to, uh, on behalf of the Corps of Engineers. And since Hurricane Sandy, I've been responsible for a variety of projects in New York City, including uh, work in Garrison Creek, Plum Beach, Coney Island, Rockaway Beach. I've, I've worked on ecosystem restorations, many beach replenishment operations, groin breakwater construction, and I've worked on a lot of studies for beach erosion and related 
uh, coastal storm risk in New York City. Um, and the overall uh, overarching purpose for our agency is to produce risk to life and property within vulnerable communities. And our focus has been on the protective aspects of engineered beaches. Um, we're limited to participate in some of the more recreational aspects. That's just a, f a feature of our, our agency and our authority. Now, speaking with engineering tools for erosion, I mean, there's not that many things you can do. You can harden shorelines with flood walls. You can build revetments, seawalls. You can work on erosion control structures like jetties or groins and breakwaters. Uh, one other thing you can do is you could retreat. You can move uh, structures, infrastructure back from the ocean and let an equilibrium shoreline form. Uh, you can learn to live with water, which basically means you could waterproof your houses and prepare for those days when the ocean will be at your front door. Um, and one of the other things we do is beach renourishment with dunes and uh, vegetated dunes to provide a soft uh, level of protection. Now, there's been a long history of beach construction in New York City. Um, since the early 1900s, in fact, the first sand pumping in the country was actually in Coney Island in 1922. Um, both city and state efforts constructed wooden rock groins in the early 1900s in many of the areas, obviously in Rockaway, prior to the Corps of Engineers' involvement. And we all know, you know, there's been severe beach erosion in Rockaway, specifically in the beach 30s and beach 90s. Uh, Coney Island has experienced quite a bit of erosion. Plum Beach is an area that, that um, till we went in and built structures there, uh, had significant erosion constantly. Now, for the beach 90s and the beach 30s within Rockaway, we average, our, we estimate that um, there's 20 feet of beach loss each year on average in those specific areas, the 90s and the 30s. Now, that's average, so that means one year you could have 80 feet and one year you could have none but uh, 20 feet per year is, is our general estimate we use for planning. Now, Corps of Engineers started work in Rockaway. We did a study in 1965. We recommended a big beach, a flood wall in front of the boardwalk, a hurricane barrier across Jamaica Bay Inlet, and flood walls that continued all the way to Coney Island. This was never completed. In 1974, Congress authorized us to build the beach portion, and they did not authorize any hard structures, any sort of jetties or any other things that um, uh, could have controlled erosion. So we began work in 1975 um, building beaches. And it's, it's pretty shocking to listen to it. Uh, we did beach renourishment in 1975, 1976, 1977, 1978, 1980, 1982, 1984, 1986, 1988, 1996, 1998, 2000, 2002, and 2004. Is that over Rockaway Beach? Yes, okay. Rockaway Beach, uh, five miles beach. Um, in 2004, the uh, existing congressional authority uh, basically ran out, and the authority was tied to a statement saying that the federal government has to do a report to find out a way to not have to replenish every two years. And that report uh, was never completed. And uh, we did not do a full-scale renourishment of Rockaway Beach uh, until after Sandy. But in the years prior to Sandy, we, we put 18 million cubic yards on Rockaway Beach. Now, if you think about it, uh, a, the biggest dumpster at a construction site is 30 yards. So think of 18 million cubic yards. And then immediately after, San well, not immediately, right after Sandy, we did place 3.5 million cubic yards between Beach 19th and Beach 149th. And the City of New York and Park City of, uh, Parks also paid extra to build the dune feature, which brought the beach up from plus 10 from our datum to plus 16 and provided a, a significant amount of extra protection that could be in place until we found a more comprehensive project. Um, so, you know, we've been working very closely with the city and the state and all the elected officials on possible options for short-term measures. And, you know, because we understand that there, there are the erosional hotspots and rockways. So we have been working to identify basically either a, a a hundred percent local cost, some sort of mixture of funding or funding hundred percent federal. And right now we have not identified a source of funding to use for an interim sand replenishment. Um, and I also say that the timeline, even at our fastest, we would need at least 10 weeks to, from award to place sand on, on the beach via dredge. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, even when you get through uh, funding, issues, you get through permitting issues, we need a 10-week 
is the very minimum we can do to mobilize a dredge and place sand at this volume. Uh, future work, uh, I'll just touch briefly on this too. The, the reformulation study, which we've been talking about quite a bit, will, re will absolutely recommend erosion control structures in the known erosional hotspots in the 30s and the 90s, uh, extending uh, the ending of which we'll have to refine in further design. Currently, I think we have the last groin ending at, at Beach 126. Uh, we've also s uh, looked at um, a refurbishment of the Beach 149th uh, Street groin, which we think is, is fundamental in maintaining the width of the beach in the Bell Harbor and Neponset area. Um, now this, we're also of course going to be recommending uh, reinforced dunes, which actually under the dune, pushed up against as far as we can up against the uh, either the baffle wall or the boardwalk will be a, uh, a pretty significant uh, structure of, of steel sheet pile and rock and on top of that the sand dune and planted grass so that there'll be a hard backstop or spine along the sand dune in case of uh, extraordinary events. Um, and then we will also work into this a renourishment effort for beach placement. So uh, this, this report we had been working on for many years, and it has included for many years larger, uh, larger elements, including a hurricane barrier. And as we studied this, and through the last few years, in the last draft report, we re realized that this is a $3 billion effort that could take upwards of a decade to build. Um, and we feel we don't have the time to wait for certain elements like the beaches and probably some areas of high frequency flood risk in the back bay. So uh, as an agency, we're moving forward with this very quickly. We'll be releasing a draft, re-releasing a draft report of this in for public review late August. And we will hopefully, uh, as soon as possible, submit that to our higher headquarters by the end of the calendar year for final approval. What, what happened in the meantime, um, when uh, Mayor de Blasio, Senator Schumer, and others went up to speak with the Chief of the Corps of Engineers, uh, the Chief of the Corps of Engineers gave us approval to do something fairly unprecedented, and that is begin design work prior to approval. So underway right now, we are actually working on designs, plan sheets. We have surveyors uh, taking measurements all over the, the peninsula, and we're moving forward with even more detailed uh, computer modeling to make sure we get this groin, these groins right. You know, I, I do have prepared in my, doc, uh, my uh, testimony some discussion of the South Shore Staten Island, but I think, you know, hearing the other testimony, we might want to. Well, I have it on, and we will go back and have this testimony. So, um, I have it. We are obviously concerned about all of New York City. Absolutely. Uh, the focus today has been a bit more on the Rockaways where uh, much more immediate need. Um, but I see that uh, the Staten Island project is uh, north of $600 million. Do um, you have any anything else you want to add before we start questions? Uh, no, I'm happy. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, provide the testimony, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you for being here today. Um, did I hear you right when you said $3 billion? Is that just for the Rockaway Peninsula, or what would that entail? No, the uh, the $3 billion would be the estimate for a hurricane barrier closure gate across Jamaica Bay. So that Inlet. would be to, to cut Jamaica Bay off, although in theory, I guess, God forbid, it, it could wash over the Rockaway Peninsula as it did last time. Uh, one thing about the, the plan design we have now for the beach portions of Rockaway, that would be uh, compatible with a future gate if one's recommended in, in a further study and further appropriation. And do you have an estimate on what it would take to put groins um, where people would like to see them uh, along the peninsula itself as opposed to that gate? I know the gate works in other parts of the world. I know there's the Thames barrier and um, protects London, but I just uh, – and would, would this gate – you, would that be that kind of thing where it go up and down uh, as necessary or? Yeah, I mean, it's important to realize that groins don't stop flooding. No, I get Sand that. that stops the flooding. Um, the gate and the groins would work together. Um, but I, I think, are you referring to extending the groin field further? Yes, I um, am referring to that. I think in my estimates you'd need another eight to ten groins to close that gap at a price of two to four million apiece, depending on the, the uh, how much yeah. rock is actually needed to build the groin and the existing bottom. 
eight to ten groins at two to four million dollars a piece. So on the short end, we'd probably be around eighteen million. On the long end, we'd be around forty million, somewhere around. That's like that. reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you own your own dredges? So no, uh, the core has a few dredges. Um, I think two. They're they're small. They're not um, large. Dredges. So we generally contract this work out. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Councilman Ulrich, I, I know you had. I'm Thank sorry you. Uh, too. No, no, I appreciate it, and I I I certainly appreciate your indulgence uh, with each panel because uh, there's so many different elements to this it's not something that we alone can fix and that's why we have all these it's not you it's your assistant i'm worried about so exactly. go ahead. no no she's fine she's uh, tending to the dog anyway but um <laughs> uh, i'm reading the testimony that you'd prepared um and it says that the um uh, we will be in a position to begin work in rockway in late 2019 using 100 percent federal funding on the public law you know 113-2 so what is funded currently by the federal government and what is not funded and how much uh, what is not funded and how much would those things cost uh, well the entire recommended project when we release the draft report will be a hundred percent federal okay um though that will be the beach design that is basically similar to the one we had recommended in the last draft as well as some high frequency flood uh, risk measures on the back bay that are still uh, currently being uh, what is the uh, price tag on that exactly the, the whole thing yeah I I haven't seen the final estimates it's somewhere four to five hundred million dollars okay so four to five I won't hold you to it so I just just so I have an idea so four to five hundred million dollars just for the jetties the sand replenishment and you mentioned some protective measures on the bay side yeah it, yeah some uh, high frequency flood risk measures we're looking at on on the bay side of the such peninsula. as what couldn't you go uh, with small it? flood walls that would protect in low level events um, you know basically when we uh, we added these to these would function with a hurricane barrier if we put them in place but we realized that there are areas in in the Rockaway and Jamaica Bay area that even with a hurricane barrier in place you would are they are so low and so um, uh, endangered by sea level rise that um, if you go 50 years in the future they would be flooding um, a very low level storm, storms you wouldn't want to close a big hurricane barrier. So we believe with the funding we had in place, 100% federal, there are certain areas that uh, we think we should examine for certain sort of smaller uh, measures. Well, are there things that you think um, we should be doing that are not funded? I, I wouldn't, I can't comment on that. I, I don't think so. Okay. Um, well, that's very interesting because I'd like to see what, what, what was in that grand master plan, that $3 billion number other than the massive seawall uh, that is uh, not included in this four to $500 million project that maybe the city should be looking at because in the past the city had contributed significantly to Army Corps projects. Is that, is that correct? I mean, that, that's a matter of public Yes, there's record. been a cost share involved in there, yep. there is a shift. And there will be in the future for future renourishment. Right. But, but for this project, it's 100% federal. So what I'd right. like to see is the city is not putting in a dime in this project, in this proposed project that you'll be releasing for public review in August. Other than operations and maintenance that they'll be re required to. Okay, uh, other than operations and, and uh, maintenance, but I'd like to see, um, I'm, I'm trying to find out how to find out what, items are not included in this project that perhaps the city can or should be paying for. Okay, because I think that the city, we have a moral imperative and an obligation, quite frankly, to contribute to this project in a very significant way uh, because our first and primary responsibility as a government is to protect our citizens and to protect people's lives and their property. And the fact that the city has basically just kicked the can down the road and said, oh, well, the Army Corps is going to pay for everything. Why are we going to waste money on sand replenishment? Why are we going to waste money on this? Why are we going to waste money on that? You know, just let the federal government pay for it. You know, that only works for so long. I'd like to see what, if there are any projects or, or enhancements to this project, maybe at the back end, that are not, you know, very cost prohibitive that, that, we, that we can pay for. You know, so I'd, I'd like to find that out. I wonder if there's a way to... Is, is there someone in Washington that we can speak to? Should we contact Senator Schumer again? I mean, I, 
I don't know. I just I, the information is not very forthcoming. Everything that you're presenting is stuff that that really we already know. Thank you, by the way, for being here. I know you don't have to be here. Parks Department is telling us stuff that, quite frankly, we already know. I want to know what we don't know. <laughs> so I want to know what we're not paying for and what we could be getting and how much those things cost. I think that that's pretty significant. Uh, yes, uh, sir. And when we get to the end of September and we release the draft report that the draft final report, um, we'll see what elements that the complete range of elements that the Corps of Engineers is willing to put forward, and then if there are other things that the, the city or the state are interested in, we can I, talk I about including that, that, those. That's a real, more. you know, question here, and that's a real uh, concern that people have. I appreciate the fact that we're doing design early, we're doing computer models, we're actually in that part of the process when we haven't actually executed any contracts, which is great, uh, and I understand that's going to speed it up, but are we still on the same timeline? that the mayor announced with Senator Schumer? Are we still on, are, are there any anticipated delays? I mean, tell me, when do you actually expect work to begin? If everything goes as planned, according to the plan as it stands now, when are we gonna see construction start? We believe construction will start before the end of 2019. Before the end of 2019, okay, all right. Make note of that, Chair. <laughs> Good man, all right, thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Ulrich. A um, couple more questions here. Um, the Army Corps recently completed, I'm, I'm informed, construction on groins and jetties in Long Beach, mm -hmm. which is immediately east of the Rockaways. Um, and I just want to know, um, will this affect the Rockaways? Was that in any way? Because I assume if, if they're building jetties and groins, you're going to capture sand in the Long Beach area, will that affect the flow of sand, which might affect erosion in uh, on the Rockaway Peninsula? Uh, the as part of the reconstruction of the groins in Long Beach, the Army Corps of Engineers is putting four million cubic yards, uh, basically updrift of Rockaway, and it has never placed sand in Long Beach before. So, uh, presumably, the addition of so much sand up there, uh, you know, the groins aren't going to capture all of it, and there'll be a lot of sand coming down toward okay. Rockaway. Four million, that's a lot. We're going to get their sand. They're going to loan us their sand. All right. Um, do you, we, uh, we asked, I, I know you were here, we asked Commissioner um, Silver about monitoring. Does the Army Corps monitor as well? I know in New York City, the Parks Department is responsible for the beaches, and, and Commissioner, uh, First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh testified that they monitor it twice a year. Um, do you guys monitor as well? Uh, informally, we monitor, but our, whenever we build a project, we have a non-federal sponsor, and that's generally the city, city of New York and Parks and Recreation specifically, and uh, we require them as part of their operations and maintenance to um, inspect the projects and let us know what the condition is. No, it's they use them to build uh, reefs. Um, how would you describe, and I don't know if you if it said you're pay grade or above, the ongoing relationship with the city and the Army Corps, is it a good one? Yeah, even at my pay grade, it's great. We, <laughs> we work with the city and state almost daily. Um, we've, we've been working closely together with them prior to Sandy, um, through Sandy, and, and since then. And is your main liaison, uh, do you, the agency in the city, is it Parks Department you liaise with mostly, or is there another agency, the Resiliency people? Office of uh, Resiliency okay. and Parks, generally together. Okay. And sometimes DEP as well. Okay, we went so quickly. Um, I know Councilman Ulrich covered this about what else we could be doing. I, I, it's you know, it is frustrating, and we do know that the beaches, you know, given time, and if nobody were living there, they would do their own thing. But we have over a hundred thousand people. Um, one of the most densely populated barrier islands in the world is the Rockaway Peninsula, and I'm just are we missing anything? If you had an unlimited checkbook, I'll give you a, give writing a check. Uh, you know, right every, now. everything that we do has impacts, and too often in ocean engineering, uh, you can do things that are bad. So it's oftentimes better to do things slowly and reversible, and to watch and to do things evolutionarily. I appreciate that, but I also have to worry about the people who are sitting over there who don't yeah. have the time. But I, <laughs> I understand that's your best best opinion, and I, I don't mean to make little of it, but it is 
It is frustrating. We've heard from a lot of people today. Um, I've been visiting the Rockaway Peninsula professionally for three decades, and I know uh, it's doing much better. Um, and in, in the light of Sandy, I have to say that the people in this room who represent many of the civic organizations um, up and down the peninsula really um, have come an awfully long way, and, and they're to be commended for their, their own personal resiliency. I see Mr. Cohn is uh, like to answer questions, so. If you're done. I, I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do appreciate the Army Corps participating in this hearing. Uh, first, uh, do, you, do you have an opinion, or does the Army have an, uh, Corps have an opinion on the condition of the, 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 the beaches at, in, in the Rockaways now in terms of erosion? I think I, before, I don't know if you were present, but the, 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 the Parks Department and I seem to have a differing opinion as to the width of the beaches now. We, we still believe it's a functioning risk reduction uh, measure in place. Th that the last or punishment has not been washed away? Correct. In its entirety. Um, the, the draft, the, I guess the, not the final draft, <laughs> but the preliminary draft talked about stopping jetties at 126th Street. Could you tell us a little bit what the rationale is for that, why they're not needed? Well, you know, the, air, the groin field is really intended to even the erosion rates of the entire beach to the same um, because groins don't solve all erosion. I mean, they, they help. They don't cure it completely. A lot of sand gets pushed out and lost into the ocean. It's not all lateral. Um, so these groins will function and they'll provide uh, uh, great cost savings. And we balance the cost savings of the groin of how much sand we have to replenish in the future. So the groin saves X amount of money but costs two to four million per groin. Uh, the, it basically, when you design a groin field to not induce a shadow, you have to have a period of, of tapered groins where the groins get smaller. So the amount of sand that's caught by each one is slightly less. And the idea is to build a taper uh, to not impact the downdrift shadow effect from the beach, well, from 126 to 49th, 149th right now. But I, I also will, will um, mention that in our further reformulation, or excuse me, refinement of the reformulation, we're doing some other tools that we didn't even have access to three years ago for computer modeling. And we're going to make sure we ha do this right. And it may mean spreading the number of groins. It, they may extend farther than 126. We may recommend that they don't even extend that far, but we do need to do some more design refinement and make sure we get the right design, but the reformulation might not capture that full refinement, but it'll be an evolving process that we'll work with the public and the agencies with. Can I, can I also just, uh, so that I, I'm clear on the testimony, you're contemplating that this project will be between ultimately between four and five million dollars? Yes. And is it, do we have any of that money? Is the federal yes, it's already appropriated. Fully, yeah. fully funded. Okay. Favorite number. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I meant to ask this before. Someone who's testifying, um, and Assemblywoman uh, um, Pfeffer Amato brought it up. Uh, I, I know that the Rockaways don't end at 149th Street, and they go considerable distance. Um, in fact, they go a long way past 149th Street. Is anything being planned? Um, for Breezy Point, and I guess Roxbury's on the north side of the, but um, for Breezy Point, there is a federal beach there um, when the Ponset ends, and, and um, Jacob Reese Park, um, the Pitch and Putt Golf Course, which is near and dear to my heart, but beyond that, we have Breezy, and that is a long way out, and I'm just wondering if there's anything being planned for that, or there? Not in this reformulation, the latest reformulation draft. There is still the, uh, the FEMA grant program that was, there was a project that, that was un in works as far as I'm, I know for Breezy Point, but uh, the beach down there is getting wider. Okay. So at Breezy Point, it's getting 20 feet plus a year instead of 20 feet back. Okay. All right. Well, um, I think I'm done, Councilman Ulrich, Councilman Cohn. Thank you, sir. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Fault, for being here today, and I recognize that you didn't have to be here. We greatly appreciate that you are here today. All right, um, patiently waiting um, for two hours and 37 minutes, and I know that they were here earlier because they're always on time in the Rockaways because they have to come from so far, uh, like I do to get to City Hall. The first panel will be uh, John Corey, uh, Bridget Klapinski. I hope I got that one right. Yes, I actually already passed. You're going to pass. You just went up a few notches in my book. I love you. You sure you don't, you don't have to pass. 
Okay. Um, then uh, we will put Ms. Kaplansky aside. Mr. Jeremy Jones. Um, I'm going to get Mr. Iori with the other Bell, Point, uh, Bell Harbor people. And um, Claire Hilger, who also lives um, in the Rockaway Beach area. Go first, Claire. Oh, yes. No. Okay. You know. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll take it up. Okay. So uh, thanks for having this, uh, Barry. I really appreciate it. Um, there's a lot of things. We got, a, we got a clock running. It's okay. already running. Right. But if you go over, uh, you know, it's in my okay. discretion. But all right. So so basically, um, you know, our, our great concern is. Uh, I think everything's been, been said today already by others. Uh, that we've been thinking forward, moving forward. Um, there's an opportunity that's been talked about at, I think, believe, the Congressman, Congressman Meeks uh, here, a meeting he had. Um, we have a dredging machine that's going to be at um, in Long Beach for the fall. Um, there's a definite possibility of DDC or EDC contacting them and getting a contract. And I know there's a lot of procurement issues with that. And um, trying to get that solved and uh, and get some sand on the beaches. We've got to start thinking about next year because as we lose, we're going to lose 20 feet according to Dan Fault for next year. Average. Which is, a well, it could be 80 feet. Could be 80, could yeah, be nothing. So, but so we got to get that moving along. That's a very important thing. And then the urgency of, for the Rockaway Peninsula, you know, we talk about recreation versus um, uh, versus uh, protection. I mean, obviously, this is a parks and recreation decision for the recreation aspect. Um, the dunes are being eaten. You know, the parks are doing a great job protecting the dunes, and it's fantastic. But the city of New York, m the mayor has to do something better to protect the dunes from the ocean, the velocity of the of, of a wave movement. So that's an important thing. And you know, like like we we are starting to see some uh, some uh, effects of uh, of the funding that's come through. We're going to see some parks uh, breaking ground very soon. It needs to be pointed out that you know, in that recreational area on the beach. We still have a, a very large area that still is not rebuilt on the uh, on the park side, and Parks is definitely doing a great job in getting that moving along. So, it's not like we're like a bunch of crybabies in the Rockaways. We have a lot going on. We've been fighting a long time. We still have a long way to go. So, I'm going to pass it over to uh, my vice president of the Rockaway Civic Association, John. Well, John, I want to thank you. I know you've been among the strongest voices um, in the peninsula. It's been my pleasure to work with you for a number of years now, and. I know it's not easy. A lot of people would have given up and, and left, but oh. you haven't. So we'll never uh, give. No. I know you're not <laughs> going anywhere. Hi, uh, my name is Jeremy Jones from Beach 92nd Street. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for convening the hearing and for giving us a chance to speak for our elected officials who were here, and also to the Parks Department. Um, I I want to speak on more of an immediate concern of getting all of the beaches open uh, this summer. And we had a great meeting, uh, some members of the Rockaway Beach Civic Board with Commissioner Silver, Lewandowski, uh, Kavanaugh, and with Portia. And we really appreciated the time. We had, I think we had a great conversation. Um, one thing that was mentioned in that meeting was that they, the PEP officers were not necessarily ca com comfortable being capable with protecting the dune. Um, and I, that seemed like one of the reasons they were closing the beach was to protect the dune, as, as I understood it. Uh, what was confusing to me is that if they can protect the dune from the boardwalk side, keeping us off the beach, they could certainly protect the dune from the beach side, keeping people walking through that closed section. Um, I'm there, my neighbors are there all winter long. We're picking up trash on that beach, all of a sudden, that beach is closed to me to do something that gives me a great peace and satisfaction. And we, we see it, and things seem to function quite well all year round. I understand more, more visitors, there's more problems, or not problems, but issues. Um, I want to see the beaches open. I want to see those red flag beaches, if they can't guard them to swimming, I want to see them open for people to walk, for me to go pick up trash. Um, they need to be open, and I don't believe that they cannot be. And if it's a swimming issue, that's one thing. The, I didn't see a single representative from the lifeguards here. That would have been nice to talk to them. I would like to reach out to you guys to try to schedule a meeting with them to work this out. But I want to see the beaches open right now. The, the resiliency stuff, I'm happy to hear that's happening. I appreciate all of the work everyone's doing. But right now, we still have two months of summer left, and I want to see the beaches open. And I want the Parks Department to look at what they can do, again, 
to, to make that happen for us, for the residents and for the visitors of Rockaway Beach. Thank you. Well, I, I thank you for your testimony. And um, First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh is here along with Queens Commissioner uh, Lewandowski. So I, I think they heard you loud and clear. I know how important it is, and I know uh, while you enjoy the beaches year-round, um, it's probably nicer maybe in some aspects of September, October, November before it gets really cold. Um, but um, it is a mecca, really, for, uh, for New Yorkers and for visitors to New York. So um, I know that uh, they will work on that. Um, Ms. Hilger? Yes. Hello. Uh, my name is Claire Hilger. I'm a Rockaway Beach resident, and I'm also secretary of the Rockaway Beach Civic Association. Um, I feel there something has changed in how Parks is looking at our beach. Um, I know Councilman Cohen says there's less beach, but we are seeing, we, me, myself, uh, my fellow residents who walk on the sand every day, they're, it's very similar to last year. And if we look at last year, those beaches were open. And so it's confusing to us that these are now closed. Um, I think there's two big things in effect, parks practices and lifeguard uh, practices. And I agree with Jeremy here in that the lifeguards are missing from this conversation. They are consulted, and we hear from Parks Department that they are a big part in their decision making, but we never hear from them explicitly what are the uh, issues that you have. Is it because you can't, I mean, it should be very explicit why they think they can't safely guard this beach. Not like, well, it's shorter, or it's lesser, less beach, or something like that. Um, and I know people like, John could produce photos of historically when the beach was even smaller than it is now and it was open. So this closure is a new thing and I think it's a new tactic to uh, tackling what's going on at our beach. And I don't, if we're gonna be concerned about beach erosion, we should also be concerned about parks practice, including ATVs, leveling of the sand with like a dragging a giant pipe and raking. Okay, there's a lot of beach practices out there that are very different and different approaches, and I know they say they're consulting, uh, but I feel like we need, we need marine scientists looking at this and really analyzing how we're taking care of our beach, not just to try to make our beach so, so incredibly safe that it's like a swimming pool. I mean, with the ocean, there is risk, and we have to respect the ocean and do the best we can to work with this so we can use our beach. We love our beach. We want to be there on the sand, and we are on that sand uh, as often as we possibly can. I got this sunburn yesterday in the water, you know, <laughs> out in the sand. So, you know, we do, we do love it, and that's why we're here. Um, we lost our home in Hurricane Sandy. We got in last July. So four years and nine months later, we're back in our home. And so we're still here. We're not going anywhere, and we want to be here. And so... Um, we really hope you consider, you know, all our voices and suggestions, and we are open to dialogue. We want to work this out. We don't want to fight against you. We want to work this through. Um, that's about all I have to say. I want to thank you all for being here today, and I will say uh, this. Um, I have, I don't remember, I have only been a member of the council for uh, just over two and a half years now. Uh, to have your borough president, your congressman, your state senator, uh, both of the council members who represent the uh, peninsula uh, is really, uh, in my way, uh, almost unprecedented. I know it's happened before. It hasn't happened here. So uh, obviously, um, and I know um, they've all been great champions, uh, not only of the beach, but of the entire peninsula and what it, it means to New York. Um, so uh, while I know there is a history here, and I've lived through it with many of you, uh, of uh, Rockaways kind of being forgotten. And some people may be like that to some extent, uh, but not when it comes to these kind of things. So I would say that uh, you're not forgotten um, and that uh, we certainly here uh, under the leadership of our speaker, Corey Johnson, uh, the members from the Rockaways, uh, Eric who's here and uh, um, Donovan Richards who had to go, um, we hear you loud and clear. And we know that uh, really the beach is the heart and soul that when people think of the Rockaways they always think of the beach first so I want to thank you for being here and we are certainly listening thank you very much thank you uh, the next panel a little further west uh, Hank Iori from the Bell Harbor Property Owners Association Alan Zwern also uh, a Bell Harbor uh, resident and John Signorelli also uh, from the association as well
All right, so who I would like to go first, please. Okay. Um, the number Identif one priority. Just identify yourself. Oh, correctly. it's Hank Iori. Okay, I'm I know that, but I have to say the, that anyway. Uh, Bell Harbor Property Owners Association. Um, the number one priority for us in the Rockways right now is storm protection. And the signaling that we're getting um, is kind of disturbing. Uh, we were particularly disturbed when they closed the beaches on a 91st to a 102nd Street. It really pointed out that we are losing sand at an alarming rate. Now, when you look at the Rockaways and you look at the area from 9th all the way to 126th Street, you primarily have a boardwalk and a berm that's there protecting the communities. When you go to 126th Street to 149th Street, you see just a berm. It's a lot less protected than even that other area that does have the boardwalk. And that's really a concern for us because along our shoreline, there is uh, erosion taking place right now at the berm. Uh, the projection of that amount of sand that we're losing there, I estimate that by 2020, it will have been breached and it'll be bringing water down to our, our homes. Uh, there's no question in my mind there'll be flooding in Bell Harbor, Rockaway Park, and Neponset by 2020. Uh, you can see it. You just have to come down and look at it. It's just, it's just that's the way it is. And what we really want to see in the future is a long-term healthy ocean side and bay side. So it's a comprehensive plan that we have to put in action. We have to move things faster. They're just not moving fast enough. Um, it's, it's a fear that I have and a fear that all of us have. On, and on our beaches, there's a likelihood that some beaches will be closed fairly soon. The Neponset beaches that you talked about, the, Neponset, the Bell Harbor beaches, and the, the 39, 38, they're all disappearing before our very eyes. All we need is another repeat of the kind of storms that we had this year for next year, and that berm will be uh, greatly diminished and flooding will be taking place in our homes. Now, in our area, if you look back at the history of it and what happened at Sandy, two people died, 11 homes were, were burned down, uh, a, a, a hotel, uh, not a, a restaurant rather, the Harbor Light was destroyed, mm -hmm. and every home was flooded in the area. And there's amazing photos of the beach houses that got totally destroyed. Well, we're no better off than we were before Sandy at this point. That's the scary part of it all. So what we're really saying is the Army Corps says they're going to be f starting in 2019. What he's really saying is the 31st of December of 2019, we may see a bulldozer there because from what they've shown as far as their timeline, they're not going to be in there 2019. It's more like 2020, 2021. We simply don't have the time to hold back and wait to see what's happening. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask you a question, Hank. Um, prior to Sandy, and, and, and when I toured the Rockaways after um, Sandy with Borough President Marshall, who was down there a lot, I had met people up and down the peninsula who said they never had water in their basement or, you know, they'd been living there, for, and including you. So, including me. So, um, it's 100 years old by Helm, too. Never water in the basement. Wow. Okay, so you answered my question. So, all right. Um, yes. Hi, I'm, I'm Alan Zwern. Um, I'm also a member of the Bell Harbor Property Owners Association. I figured you were somehow. And, yes. I live on, uh, and I've been on Beach 141 for the past uh, 28 years. Um, I ha I, my thing is obvious. It's these photos that you were given. Okay? It starts um, with a photo that I took on my phone back in July of 2015. The sand was replenished in 2014. That's photo number one I'm talking about. Sand was replenished in 2014. Those pylons that I'm standing next to, which um, it's not even knee high, um, they're over seven feet tall. But the year before when the sand was put in, only the tallest one showed two inches above the sand. That's how high the replenishment came, okay? Within a year, they were seven feet out of the sand. Now fast, then a picture number two next to it is me standing in an equivalent spot at the end of the wooden jetty at Beach 142. And the bottom is showing me in that spot with the entire jetty exposed and those pylons 150 feet out into the ocean. If I was to stand next to those pylons now, I'd probably be 12 feet deep, okay? So page two uh, shows that same picture, but then turning your camera around, here's the beach 
there's the erosion shown and the scoffing of where a, high t where a tide would take out the beach and cut it down. And just behind it, uh, where the green is, that's the berms that Hank was talking about. The lifeguard's chair, which in the past was much closer to the ocean, is now up on the berm. The berms themselves get eroded when there's a storm out to sea, and the, the, tide, the high tide comes in even higher and rougher. So the berm is starting to be eroded away as well. It is imperative, imperative that something be done because we're sitting ducks. Another storm comes in, not even as strong as Stan Sandy. The entire peninsula, the south shore of it, is sitting ducks. And then the bay fills up and spills over onto the north side of the peninsula, and it's Walter, it's a, it becomes a bathtub. And that's how there was flooding in my basement as well, as, long as, as well as all my neighbors. So I thank you for having this meeting. I thank you for your concerns. Th what I've shown you supports what uh, Councilman Cohn was talking about earlier. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zorn. <coughs> Mr. Signorelli. Yes, good morning. I'm a Process John of elimination. I'm <laughs> a member of the Bell Harbor Association. And I'd like to read uh, from my write-up to the committee. Uh, the urgent decision made by the uh, very top Parks and Recreation Management to close the one-half mile plus length of the prime Rockaway uh, Beach Recreation Area from Beach 91st Street to Beach 102nd Street just before announcing the summer seas and beach opening was unexpected, alarming to say the least, and the start of a crisis. The decision should have been announced months prior to allowing ample assessment, preparedness, and to judge its immediate impact. Who was asleep during the winter? Meaning did anyone periodically inspect the eroding beach area that was repeatedly reported by the community many, many times to parks and other city agencies, including the mayor and the news outlets? The sudden and unexpected action by parks due to the safety concerns for beachgoers caused multiple agencies to mobilize an emergency without advanced warning and reasonable community notice. It's assumed the New York City and New York State government agencies, besides others, were unexpectedly placed on notice for the one and a half mile plus Rockaway Beach closure. The representation are listed as follows. The mayor's office, U.S. senators, U.S. representatives, New York State Senators, New York State Assembly, New York City Council Members, Borough President, District Manager, Community Board, and Community Civic Associations, the New York C City Police Department, the Parks Police Department, the Emergency Medical Services, Community Board 14, New York City and New York State Sister Agencies, U.S. Armed Army of War Engineers, and others. Note that it hasn't been mentioned of the New York City Office of Emergency Management, OEM, did OEM get involved and take part in the Rockaway Peninsula Beach emergency with reasonable prior notice from the New York City Parks and Recreation? If so, what were OEM's actions taken or actions not taken and how are they identified? The OEM Watch Command monitors the weather 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Did OEM External Affairs Community Outreach activate the Community Emergency Response Team? public information, and any public and private initiatives. To this end, I am recommending eight tasks be implemented and focused on. They are as follows. One, have the New York City Emergency Management Office involved and take part in the Rockaway Peninsula Beach Emergency. Local law, tw number two, local law 24. The New York City Emergency Management Office must respond and be included in emergency closure at Rockaway Beach, one beach first 41st Street to Beach 102nd Street. What plans and protocols are in place to guide New York City response to weather emergencies events such as numerous coastal storms, that is storm surge, hurricanes, wind storms, wind driven rain and water, flash floods and, and tidal waves. Three, local law 26. The OEM must require responsible agencies to prepare for and respond to Sandy Road emergencies and, and shoreline related incidences and, prov and provide an annual sand preparedness and report for each sandy erosion event and or incident foreseen and occurring. Four, similar to New York City roadway salt storage facilities, OEM must require funds for New York City beach sand storage facilities. Five, select New York City areas to store and purchase and acquire sand at New York City beach sand facilities during the winter months for its use to manage and repair minor and major beach erosions and fortified locations that have been damaged or deteriorated by hurricanes, coastal storms, and ocean currents. Six, 
perform training, exercise, and evaluation by conducting tabletop, functional, and possible full-scale exercises of envisioned shorefront instances. Also develop and conduct agency and partner training. Seven, study and understand the community health and medical hazard mitigation, human resources, plan management, transportation, infrastructure for coastal areas besides logistics. Eight, formulate the best practices by other U.S. coastal agencies. The community foresaw and publicized the Rockaway Beach erosion. New York City Parks and Recreation and their hired consultant, Erich, Erich thus now causing the closure and into the distant future. This adversely affected the community to affect the Rockaway community's population, major summer tourism, transportation, bad New York City and community publicity, disrupting commercial and non-commercial businesses financially besides their reputation. Be aware this not so slow beach erosion disaster continues and will most likely expand along the present one and a half mile plus stretch and hopefully not at other community beach areas since sand replenishment fast tracking is not occurring and planned grow, uh, growing installations are, are off into the distant future. Lastly, the NOAA 218 year Atlantic hurricane season outlook shows 10 to 16 named storms, five to six hurricanes, and one to four major hurricanes. I'd like to thank the committee for allowing me to present this. Thank you. Could you make sure we have a copy of that for our official record? Thank I appreciate it very much. I, I know uh, how active your civic is, and I, I greatly appreciate that. And uh, one question, I think I went out, I was with Barbara Larkin uh, right after the storm, and I, they were trying to explain to me what a baffle wall was, and I really couldn't understand it. So I took a ride out one Sunday morning, and maybe some of you were there. Did, did, did they baffle walls? Were they, were they ever built? Excuse yeah. my ignorance. Yeah, you can go on the back. Yeah. Okay. It, it's an interesting question. The baffle wall um, was built. When we first saw what they had proposed, it was shown to us in one form formulation. When they actually built it, they built it in such a way that it's actually dangerous. Well, that's not good. Uh, because if it were hit with a, a, a flush of water, people who live close to the beach wall there, the baffle wall, they would have a four foot by 10 foot piece of concrete come flying into their homes because it's only connected by the I-beams that are holding it in position and resting on top of another four by tw 10 foot uh, piece of concrete that's in the ground. So at ground level, there's a seam, and you'll probably see it if you take a good look at it, um, you hit it, it'll it'll come popping right out and go right into people's homes. And what's and protect is the baffle wall behind the berm? Yeah. It's behind the berm. Okay. All yeah. right. All right. Thank you for uh, educating me on that. Go ahead, Councilman. Was, was that that the Barbara Larkin, my fifth grade teacher? Was that yes. The yes, it was. Well, I just okay. wanted to be sure. All right. Thank you. I'll, I'll send her your best. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you for coming today. Um, we have four people on this panel. Um, the next one, which will probably be our last, Joe Hardigan, uh, Andrea Colon, Jill Laurie, I hope I got that right, and Dedis Futo, Futuran, Futurian, Futurian, all right, Futurian, all right, Futurian, all right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and if you could testify in the order I called you, that would help me a lot. <laughs> okay. I guess I'll go first. You go first, Joe. Joe Hardigan from Rockaway. Um, I'm retired from the fire department. I've probably been to more jetty beach erosion meetings than everybody in this room combined. Down the Jersey Shore, Long Beach, in Manhattan, I've listened to everybody. At least three times I've been down the Jersey Shore before they started replenishing the sand. The beach was, you name the jetty, they got it and the beach is wiped out. Simple formula, once the beach gets a certain point, you have to put sand on the beach. A lot of other people covered other things. You have to have sand on the beach, period. There's no way of getting around it. We need key jetties. We don't need a ton of jetties. We need key jetties. The reason why I came here, uh, Donovan Richards spoke on it. I'm um, going to speak on the bird sanctuary. Bird sanctuary is a mile and a half long. It's in predominantly black neighborhood. Posh came in, took away the beach. There is no other beach on the full south shore of, of uh, Long Island that has closed the beach because of bird sanctuary. 
There are other areas where they take sections of the beach, but not a mile and a half, and they're expanding it. When they talk about closing the beach in the 90s, if you had the bird sanctuary and that together, it's two miles of a seven-mile beach. Uh, New Jersey Shore is worth $32 billion a year. If you break it down per mile, it comes down to $260 million per mile. Rockaway is 11 miles long. It should be worth $3 billion in economic activity. That's the real money, $3 billion. I'm half wrong. I'm a third wrong, $1 billion. The black kids in Far Rockaway cannot use the beach. It does not happen in Long Beach. It does not happen in Fire Island. It does not happen in the Hamptons. It happens nowhere else but in Rockaway. A mile and a half of beach, can't use it all summer long. And what's the good of putting sand on the beach if you can't use the beach? Now, uh, what's funny about it, nothing's funny about it at all, it's the widest beach in all of Rockaway. It's the biggest beach. And what could be done uh, at the end of the summer since it's the widest beach, it gains the most sand, you could skim some of the sand off of that to push it in front of Rockaway uh, in the beaches that are closed down in the 90s. One of the things that was said earlier, there's nobody here from Breezy Point. No one. They have one good jetty, and the sand has built up three miles back, three city blocks long. In fact, the sand has built up so much that it's now into the inlet and they have to dredge the inlet in 18. I'm fighting to see who gets that sand. We want the sand. But it's really unfair. We have 85 acres of vacant oceanfront property in front of that bird sanctuary and we can't do anything. So the Parks Commission was inaccurate when he said about the, the, the federal rules because in Breezy Point they have the same federal rules, same bird sanctuary, and they're allowed to use it. Thank you. Mr. Hardigan, are you telling me that in from Beach 9th Street all the way out to the 50s or 60s, there's no beach open. I'm sure there's, a, there's like three spots, but the, the bird sanctuary keeps getting. You got to be very careful with the facts because no, when no. you say none, that's a big difference from, uh, between from some. Beach 30th Street to Beach 60th Street, you right. can't use the beach. But I and then there's a couple of openings. You heard him say it, and that bird sanctuary keeps expanding. I understand that, but some of that is also in the federal government because it's you know it's the birds are protected by we don't protect them. I don't have any problem with the piping plovers, but, you know, they are a protected species, so. Right, but they have the same bird sanctuary in Rockaway in Breezy Point in a gated community, and they are allowed to use the beach. You explain to me. I, I don't, you can't. don't know enough and about can, it. I just and nor can parks, why a gated community can use the beach, and a, a neighborhood that has low-income people can't use the beach. It's not fair. I, I don't know enough about the piping plover. I just wanted to make sure that, that some of the beaches where you mentioned were, in fact, open. So okay. I thank you for your testimony. Right. Ms. Colon. Hello, my name is Andrea Colon. I'm the community engagement organizer for the Rockaway Youth Task Force. I'm 17 and will be attending Borough College in the fall. Great and, school. Um, I personally live uh, in Far Rockaway, where um, this man was mentioning. And it is a problem. Like, there's only a cert certain spots of the beach that you can access. But I am here as an ally to say that erosion is not something that happens overnight. Um, and we have been seeing the problem for a long time. I go to Beach Channel High School, so going to the boardwalk after school with friends, like, always happens. And you see it sometimes. It gets to the point where it, it like, goes, like, the ramp. Like, literally, their water is, like, on the ramp. And um, as others have said, it's not acceptable that we were given a notice um, a few days before the closing, and this will negatively impact businesses, decrease tourism, and be a burden for many residents, and it should never have gotten to the point where the beach had to be closed. Um, the lack of utilization is something that is seen outside of beaches. The Rockaways are a federally labeled food desert. There is a lot of land that is not developed, and two in particular on the east end that are not um, utilized. These particular spaces could provide a lot of fresh um, and affordable produce for families, but it is not, and it is all under parks land. And like he said, um, it all happens to be in predominantly communities of color. And I understand that today's hearing is about a um, portion of beaches being closed, but the conversation needs to be had about all underutilized parks land in Rockaway. I thank you for your testimony. I, I do know that uh, the members, the elected officials there, um, uh, certainly uh, take this with great concern, and, and that's why we had this hearing today when I first heard about it. 
Um, I spoke to my colleagues here and, and to the borough president. Uh, those are my first calls, and we wanted to shine a light on it because we know that the beach is, it's everything in the Rockaway. People live there, but really it's not very wide. It's not uh, miles wide. It's not even a mile wide. Um, in some places, I guess it is, but um, as you go further west, it's, it's all about the beach. So um, I thank you for being here today, and good luck at Baruch. Miss Laurie, am I pronouncing that right? Yes, it's Laurie. Thank Good. you, and Ooh. thank you so much. <laughs> I didn't get his name right. I gotta get one of them right. <laughs> thank you for holding this. You hearing look like today. you're ready to go to the beach today. Yes, I, I appreciate I am. your attire. Please, <laughs> yes, I'm bringing the beach to you. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, because of all the other testimony, I'm really kind of going off my notes, and I'm really going to speak from my heart, That's which okay. is what I That's like to do most. Probably best. Um, I'm a clinical social worker. Um, I've lived in Rockaway Bay for 10 years now. I was there before Sandy, during Sandy, and I'm still there. Um, my experience of how this whole thing unfolded is really very disgusting. I have to use that word. That's okay. Um, you know, if you know anything about the way people's minds work, the worst thing that you can do for people in terms of heightening their level of stress is by um, doing unexpected things without any notice and giving them no control. I mean, that's stress 101, um, which is exactly what happened here. We were treated like shells on the sand. No regard for our feelings, our livelihoods, or anything else. And I think that is really disgusting. Um, I live right across from the beach. I live right across from the surf beach at 90th Street. And I take great, or I did take great pleasure in walking along the shoreline, entering on Beach 91st, going west. I cannot do that now. And the reality is that it is safer for me to walk along the shoreline than it is to cross the streets in New York City. And I cannot do it because of this arbitrary decision. Um, so I think things really need to be evaluated and reevaluated to see what is really truly in the interest of safety and what was just a blanketed decision that maybe was easy or convenient or, you know, I don't know what it was. Um, I just want to look and see what else. Um, and, you know, I think with Rockaway, one of the things I think people have come to know is that our vulnerability is our greatest strength. And we are a group of people that are passionate. We're passionate about Rockaway, about the beach, about the ocean, and things need to change. We need to be safe. And when we hear protection um, presented to us, it needs, we need to know that it's coming from a true place of caring about us who we are as individuals and as a community. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I, um, I'm, I'm happy that the outcry did produce, and we will have, um, starting this Saturday, we will have some parts of that um, beach reopened. And I know that the Rockaways is indeed very, very tough. And most people don't talk about this, but one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, Richard Feynman, went to Far Rockaway High School. So. So did Bernie Madoff, but we, we won't talk about him. Ulrich, where did you go to high school, just for the record? Uh, cathedral Prep. Okay, Cathedral Prep. We that. have another great mind here that went to Beach Channel. And I, I will tell you, full, full disclosure, when I was graduating IS-237, I wanted to go to Beach Channel High School uh, with my friend uh, Sam Soche, who's now the principal of Martin Van Buren High School, and another friend of mine, Vincent DeBone, who became an environmental engineer in New Jersey until Mrs. Warman told us it would be about two hours each way on public transit, and um, our enthusiasm waned quite quickly. So um, I never did get the, uh, the benefit of a Rockaways education as some of my colleagues here. So, but thank you for being here today. I appreciate, appreciate that. Um, Mr. Dennis Futurayan, did I get that right now? Yeah. Not the second time either. Not the Victorian. second time. <laughs> I'm going to make some... That's all right. Uh, plenty of people have uh, difficulty with the last name. Um, good afternoon. I'm, I'm just going to read off of my, uh, That's okay. my testimony. It says you're, you're representing yourself, which is a good thing. Yeah. 
good afternoon. My name is Dennis Vittorian. I'm a Rockaway Beach resident on Beach 81st uh, in Shorefront Parkway. I want to first thank this committee for holding a hearing on this pressing issue that affects my home from its commerce and livelihood to its continued to re recovery from the environmental devastation from Hurricane Sandy. It has been six years since Sandy hit the Rockaways and the peninsula has been slowly recovering. The neighborhood is steadily returning to the image that it once had, especially after looking at the vast amounts of beachgoers visiting our shores, business owners serving the community at the boardwalk, and new developments being constructed, bringing new families into the Rockaways. However, there's a big gap in this picture, one stretching for approximately 11 city blocks. On May 21st, the Department of Parks and Rec abruptly announced the closure of beach access stretching from Beach 91st to Beach 102nd. The city claims that there's not enough beach for safe recreational activities and so it must close a sizable stretch of land, presenting those coming from other boroughs, preventing those coming from other boroughs from enjoying the beach and local business owners in the vicinity from serving consumers. While the Rockaway residents were told that there are another four and a half miles of beach that we can go to, it avoids the crux of the issue. Why did it take the city so long to announce that action needed to be taken? And what has it been doing since they knew of the erosion issue to the time of the announcement? Seniors living in front of the stretch of beach will have a hard time getting to what used to be a beach in front of their home, while the other parts of the beach may become incredibly congested, congested heating up, maybe simmering tensions between uh, homeowners and the tourists. Rockaway has long felt neglected by the city, state, and federal governments, whether it was dealing with burdens and parking regulations and on-again, off-again ferry service and dreams of a more robust sub subway infrastructure. This is not to say that the city has not done anything, but it has not done enough, and action must be expedited to address this serious issue. I applaud the city's actions reported this morning that Beach 96 to 98 streets will be reopened for swimming on a trial basis, as well as giving businesses located at that brief stretch a 50% rate rent break for the summer, a skate ramp, missed in cooling stations in a children's sand play area. I urge the city to hold more discussions to identify areas within the 11 block street closure that can be reopened for swimmers and to also look into ways to push the Army Corps of Engineers to start work on replenishing the sand on our beach immediately after their November study report, not after next summer. One constant criticism of government is that it does not move fast enough and we need to acclimate to a 21st century style type of accountability for all New Yorkers. I would even urge the council to adopt a resolution to show their united support, pushing the Army Corps of Engineers to work faster and for Congress to ensure all appropriations to the matter. Once again, I thank you for your time and look forward to how the council will address this serious problem. Let's refill the sand, build jetties, take the matter into our own hands if the federal government is slow walking in response and show what good governance is all about. Thank you, Mr. Futorian. I got it right that time? I spelled it out, I was careful. Um, if there's anybody else that wants to testify, we're going to, um, nobody else has their hands gone up. Okay. That's, oh, uh, if you would step forward, yes, and uh, if you could tell us your name. This panel is dismissed. Thank you very much for being here. What? Okay. We do need you to fill out a slip first, though. Okay. That's okay. Before I forget, I do want to thank uh, the Army Corps and the Parks Department, uh, especially uh, Commissioner Lewandowski and First Deputy Commissioner uh, Liam Cavanaugh for being here to, for this whole hearing. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Sergeant at Arms. Maribel Arajo. Not bad, not bad for a kid from Parmenard. Okay, Ms. Araujo, please. Um, I um, represent, okay. I represent, um, I own a business on the boardwalk. It's called Caracas. Um, I all, I'm also the connection between the parks department and all the concessions. Um, just wanted to get a couple of things straight. Uh, we do have a good relationship with the parks department. Good. Um, I would say, you know, we understand that our rules and procedures and bureaucratic things that we have to go through. Um, we have been there since 2011 with a 10-year agreement, um, and we have gone through Sandy, post-Sandy. I didn't have a, I, I, I think 106 was, was a concession that has, um, was connected with the boardwalk at the last. Um, I didn't have a beach for a long time. 
we, you know, we're there, we want to keep going. Um, one thing that has been said is that we're getting a 50% discount. It's not a discount yet, it's just a deferral. That means it's a postponing of the rent. Um, which I understand is part of the procedure that the Parks Department has to go through. They can't make a decision right away. They can waive the rent. Um, it has a, 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 you know, certain steps that they, got, they have to go through. Um, I personally, I am the person that uh, actually creates the reports for them. And uh, I really don't like the idea of holding the numbers that we have been giving them for the month of May as a flag to say that we are getting a lot of beach goers and that our numbers are actually better right now than they were before. Um, I think that what we're seeing right now is a side effect or you know, you can say we're collecting the fruits for seven summers that we have been there every summer providing great food, entertainment, in a really decent group of business businesses that have been there. Um, and yeah, everybody's waiting for Rockaway to open. We open, they come. A lot of people don't know up to this day that the beaches are closed. A lot of them think that the whole entire beach is closed. And some of them know the details. So I think that we're gonna really start seeing the impact of this last minute decision in the month of June and um, I'm personally working with them in providing um, reports. Hopefully I'm gonna be creating one for the first 15 days of the month of June. And we're gonna see that the 97th Street concession is definitely about 35 to 40% under. Um, we are working with Porsche really close um, to provide different things, to activate areas, to create more of a moment so people come to the concession. Um, more as a destination, and we're gonna make the best that we can. But just wanted to get things straight because I know that there was an article yesterday that talked about the rent deduction. We don't have that rent deduction yet. Okay. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, I thank you uh, for being here today. I thank you for testifying. I thank you uh, for being willing to invest in the Rockaways as well. Um, it takes people with spirit it's a it's a great neighborhood it's a great community and i have enjoyed the food at caracas so i know how good it is <laughs> so um with that um i am going to close this hearing this is my favorite part of the hearing is the gaveling in and out so uh thank you all for being here today um for shedding light on this again thank you uh to the department of parks and recreation to uh, the u.s army corps of engineer so, and um, all the uh, people from the Rockaways, New Yorkers for Parks, who are here, my colleagues on the New York City Council, and to the elected officials of the Rockaway for being here today. With that, we close this hearing at 227.